Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. I apologize to those of you who've been hanging on since 1 p.m. We went fairly long on the floor of the Senate today, overriding a number of the governor's vetoes and having fairly extensive debate. So thank you for your patience. We have a number of bills today. Um, as uh, most people know, uh, the prime uh, proponent after the sponsor will get up to five minutes. They do not have to use all five minutes. Subsequent speakers will have up to two and a half minutes. Uh, I will try to explain if there's no opposition, which might have you temper your comments. Uh, but again, we uh, welcome all testimony, uh, oral or written. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to begin with Senate Bill 431, that's Senator King, Maryland Sign Language Interpreter Act. Um, she will be followed by uh, Stephanie Summers, Peggy Faulkner, Tara Condon, and, um, and uh, Leslie uh, Puzio. And then we'll move to Fable with Amendments, Rebecca Minor and Michelle Westfall. And I only see one unfavorable among the many documents have written, um, most are in favor. Uh, with that, uh, welcome Senator King. Uh, you're muted, Senator King. Senator King, you're muted. I already did that once. Okay, uh, let's we start again. It by mistake. <laughs> Thank you. Senate Bill 431, the Maryland Sign Language Interpreters Act. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, despite having one of the largest populations of deaf and hard of hearing residents in the country, Maryland is one of a very few states in the country that does not require licensing or standards for sign language interpreters. This has resulted in, at times, devastating effects for deaf and hard of hearing individuals in our state, especially in medical and legal settings. Senate Bill 431 will set the framework for sign language interpreters to meet certain standards and become licensed. I am also offering two amendments. One adds language that recognizes that, the, that there is oral to sign, sign to oral, as well as sign to sign interpreting. The second amendment will require licensing for those individuals involved with video remote interpreting. Deaf and hard of hearing individuals in Maryland deserve protections from unqualified or fraudulent interpreters. And so I request a favorable report on Senate Bill 431 with amendments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, three pan panelists with me today, Stephanie Summers, Tara Congdon, and Peg Faulkner. Senator, um, can we hold, do you have a few minutes? Can we hold questions until the whole panel speaks and then come back to you with any sure. questions? Okay. Sure. Uh, Ms. Uh, Summers, please welcome. Is Ms. Summers with us? Mm -hmm. She was there. I'm not sure where she oh, okay. Summers is saying I'm here. Okay. And the interpreter, okay, now my video is on. I would like to ask if it's possible for Peggy Faulkner to go first, only because she has a hard stop at 2 p.m. Would that be all right? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we'll go to Ms. Faulkner then. Peg. And give the interpreter one moment to change the pin and find Ms. Faulkner. Okay. Hello, honorable chairperson and members of the committee. My name is Peggy Faulkner. I'm a college student at the University of Maryland. I've struggled with unqualified interpreters in school and in my internship. 
These had detrimental effects on both my education and my internship with the police department where I had my internship. In one situation in particular, an agency hired a non-certified interpreter who had recently moved to the United States from Japan. This is relevant not only because this person was a novice interpreter and had only recently learned American Sign Language, which in and of itself was beyond shocking and disappointing. They also then assigned her to a police department assignment without knowledge of American laws. This resulted in multiple misspellings of common terms, for example, probable cause. Her lack of qualification and lack of fluency in American Sign Language led me to take inaccurate notes, which could have had a detrimental effect on my studies. Fortunately, the team interpreter working alongside her noticed the many errors and decided to stop correcting her and instead take over and do all of the interpreting, which was also beyond unfair for that interpreter who had to work for hours on her own because of her team's incompetence. Unfortunately, situations like these are not uncommon. Coworkers of mine have also noticed mistakes made by unqualified interpreters. Fortunately, many times they have been able to catch these interpretation errors before we've started investigating cases. If they had not picked up on these errors, that could have affected those victims due to this miscommunication and disfluency. Also, but also many unqualified interpreters are not trained in policy or ethics. My professors have also been gravely frustrated and concerned about my studies and the potential for interpreters' lack of qualification to potentially lead to poor performance in class and even failure. Unqualified interpreters in my college classes have led to multiple interruptions of class proceedings. One semester in particular, an interpreter interrupted the professor so often that we both asked the interpreter coordinator to make an interpreter replacement. The coordinator insisted that this interpreter was qualified solely on the basis of her being a native signer. That in and of itself does not qualify an interpreter. They continued to interrupt the class proceedings, asking for clarification, asking the professor to pause, our repeated quests for replacement were ignored and I had no other legal recourse. This was, this reached a point where a legal class that I was taking where this unqualified unethical interpreter was working led the professor to make so many complaints that they themselves also submitted a report to the interpreter coordinator and asked the interpreter to not come back. Despite our requests, the interpreter came back the interpreter. I hate to interrupt Ms. Faulkner. Um, you have two and a half minutes and I believe you need to wrap up and then we'll go back to um, Ms. Summers. This is the ASL interpreter. I'm not seeing Ms. Faulkner on my screen any longer. So I'm trying, I don't see her. I'm not seeing her either. We'll see her in the Try, what I'm what I'm trying to do is get Ms. Faulkner to to be in the speaker view so the audience can see. Okay. Peg um, is saying I'm sorry, I think I missed the end of that. It seems as though my video was turned off. I just um, have one yeah. last line if I'm able to complete that and Please. that will be yes. the end of it. Thank you. Resume my place. Okay, um, so I just wanted to end by saying that support for this bill will help protect my rights and countless other Marylanders and give us a path toward justice if something negative were to happen to me or other deaf Marylanders as a result of poor interpretation. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my testimony. Thank you very much, Ms. Faulkner. I understand you have a hard stop. If you can stay and possibly there may be or may not be questions for you and other panelists. So we understand if you have to leave for class or another uh, responsibility. Uh, with that, we will go back to uh, Ms. Summers 
who seated her uh, opening spot. Uh, Ms. Summers, you and your interpreter are on. This is the interpreter. I'm also not seeing Ms. Summers at this time. Does someone have a way to connect Ms. Summers and activate her video? So the same. Okay, the video. We just need audio for Ms. Summers. No, I'll be oh, sorry, audio. Sorry. Is, she's, right, she's back. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Summers. Uh, back to you. Welcome. Please begin. Thank you. Hello, honorable chairperson, and hello to the members of the committee. Again, I am Stephanie Summers, and I'm a representative of the Maryland Interpreter Licensure Team, which is a joint effort on behalf of the Maryland Association of the Deaf and the Potomac Chapter of the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. I'd like to outline points as to why we are proponents of this bill. First, we view this as largely a consumer protection bill. Secondly, according to Director Brick of the Governor's Office of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, as was said earlier, Maryland is the only state with no regulation of sign language interpreters of any kind. Also, some of you may be wondering why it is that we're asking that this bill be housed under the Department of Labor with support of ODHH. This is because ODHH is a partisan office and that serves at the pleasure of the governor with the purpose of advising the governor of, on matters pertaining to deaf and hard of hearing Marylanders. With ODHH's advice and the mechanism that DOL provides working in conjunction with each other, to create a system to regulate the interpreting services provided in Maryland, we believe that they can work well along with an independent licensure board. I'd also like to say that there are businesses in Maryland that already follow the practices outlined in this bill and are proponents of ensuring good quality communication. Other businesses in opposition to the bill are likely opposed because they are in the regular practice of hiring interpreters who are uncertified, unqualified, or who simply put themselves out there as interpreters and are in fact not fluent enough or qualified to be actually working as interpreters. These unqualified interpreters are also in turn exploited by these businesses because they are often put in situations for which they are not qualified, yet they're led to believe that their fluency levels or interpreting skill levels are sanctioned or appropriate. You just heard stories from Peg about the effects of these sorts of situations on her education. You'll also in a moment hear stories from Tara. And unfortunately, the stories that they'll share are not the exception. Unfortunately, they, they represent the experiences of countless other Marylanders. Deaf people have often complained about this lack of infrastructure and it's high time with this bill that our voices are protected. The lack of consumer protection has led to countless cases, again, primarily in medical and legal cases or situations where the ramifications are life-changing and often permanent for deaf individuals. Again, our voices need to be heard it is time to show support for this bill. Thank you so very much for that support of SB 431. Thank you, Ms. Summers, for your testimony. Uh, if you can stay with us, there may be questions of the committee. Uh, let's go to Ms. Con uh, Ms. Uh, Congdon, please. Hold on, the interpreter needs to pin Ms. Congdon. Oh, 
before we proceed, I would like to make one request regarding technology. For the last two deaf people, they did not show up on YouTube because apparently the spotlight feature in Zoom is being used. That means that the person whose audio the video was attached to is showing up on YouTube. So the deaf people, that means we're not able to be seen on YouTube. Could whoever's handling the technology on the back end please spotlight Tara Congdon's video feed? Yep, I'm trying to find her right now. Thank you for pointing that out. Bear with me, please. Let, let's hold. And I believe that one way to do it, if it's, um, I think that one way to do it is to select that uh, three dot or ellipsis looking thing at the top right of my thumbnail. Um, one of the options should be to manually spotlight a video. Yeah, so she she should appear, she should be on the screen now. On the YouTube. Can anybody confirm? Can anyone confirm that she is spotlighted and does appear on the YouTube? I just checked and it looks like whoever's speaking is still the one showing up on YouTube. Let me remove. Okay, how about now? Are we able to see Ms. Cogden? Can anybody confirm? Is anybody tracking on YouTube? All right, there's a bit of a delay on YouTube. It looks like it's maybe 15 seconds behind. Okay, give it a couple seconds. I still see you, Mr. Pinsky. Yeah, no okay, it's, it should, she's definitely been pinned, so. Uh... We apologize for the technical glitches. Yeah, so her 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 pen is is on. This is Dr. Puzio. There's actually a difference between pinning and spotlighting. Pinning is just going to show up on the Zoom call, but if you spotlight, that will actually hold the deaf consumer who is signing on the Zoom call or on the okay. YouTube. Okay. Let's see. How about now? Yep, it worked. Okay, okay. thank and you. Ms. Congdon has just said, I'd like to double check YouTube on my end. Mm. Okay. okay. Please right. begin, thank you. And again, our apologies. Thank you also so much for working that out. I want to ensure that the deaf viewers are able to see um, my remarks directly in ASL. Okay, shall I begin? Yes. Honorable chairman and members of the committee, thank you for having me today. My name is Tara Congdon and I'm a Maryland resident. I'm here today to describe the real human cost of not having interpreter licensure. In 2017, my husband and I began our fertility journey during which we interacted with several interpreters. In my written testimony, I described seven examples that involved uncertified interpreters, interpreting students and recent graduates who held themselves out as qualified for situations for which they were not. This caused physical, emotional and financial harm to me. I'd like to share one of those stories with you today. In 2019, 
we made our first attempt at an embryo transfer. My husband and I, of course, were nervous, but excited. It was a wonderful milestone for us until we met the interpreter. Her signing was unintelligible, to put it mildly. She also, in turn, was so unfluent that she could not understand me either. She had just graduated from an out-of-state interpreting program and recently moved to Maryland. This was immediately anxiety-inducing, and it reached a point that I was unable to understand any of the instructions that she was trying to sign because she was not fluent enough. I turned to my husband to ask for his assistance. The interpreter interjected and said to only look at her and to not ask my husband for support. She spoke down to me as though I were a child. She misinterpreted and misunderstood so many times that I had to ask her to leave the situation. She refused. This was even more upsetting because of the level of disrespect and disregard for our desires. My husband was trying to express to the doctor what was going on. The interpreter started speaking directly to the doctor and saying, oh, the patient is upset because I misunderstood her birthday. This dishonesty was so upsetting that I started crying. My husband had had enough, forcefully asked her to leave, and she had to be removed from the room by the medical professionals. I started crying. The doctor saw that I was in such distress that they were unsure whether they should proceed with the embryo transfer because of the levels of negative hormones in my body at that time that it would make for less than suitable conditions for the embryo transfer, which would in turn have a negative effect on the success of the transfer. Yet we had no choice. If we didn't do the transfer in that moment, we would have had to discard the embryo, the makings of our baby. We decided to move forward with the transfer. I did become pregnant as a result of the transfer. However, 12 weeks later, she died. That interpreter was paid in full for the assignment that she showed up to. She has not and will never face any consequences. There's no one I could report her to, no mechanism to report her or the many other unqualified interpreters I've had to try to communicate through. After that, I had truly had enough. I spent countless hours writing emails, making phone calls, advocating for myself to be able to choose qualified interpreters. In short, our, I can't tell you how hard I fought. And I finally was allowed to select interpreters. We then, from that point on, worked only with certified interpreters and had good experiences. Our second embryo transfer was a success. I became pregnant and it Great. resulted in the birth of our daughter last June. Um, Thank you, Ms. Condon. You're gonna have- Can I just show you my daughter? <laughs> very briefly, yes. She's a prop. <laughs> We're- we clearly are very happy for the subsequent experience. Thank you. I, I would like to just add that in addition Rachel. to our first baby, we'd like to have her have a sibling. And I'm hopeful that when I go through this whole procedure again, I will not have to revisit the trauma that was experienced in our the first half of our journey. Hopefully Thank you. we won't have to fight Thank for you. qualified interpreters, nor Thank will you, other deaf consumers Th Thank who you. also need protection. Okay, um, moving to uh, Leslie uh, Puzio. And we need a way to hold them accountable. Ms. Condon, we're, we have to I move apologize. on your time. Oh, I'm at time, at time. Okay, thank you so much. Please say yes to this bill. Um, it really is tremendously important to us all. Thank you. Ms. Puzio. Good afternoon, your honorable chairperson uh, and committees, members of the committee. Um, if we can actually, just like Tara had mentioned, if we can um, dual spotlight both myself as well as the sign language interpreter. So that is highlighted on the YouTube video as well. I'll pause to let that. Um, the Stan, can you replicate what you yes. did for Dr. Puzio and her? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mrs. Puzio, who was the second person? Um, it would be interpreter Anna, so that um, okay, and that individuals. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. One moment while I find her. Name. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for your tech assistance. We appreciate it. Um, again, my, my name is Dr. Leslie Puzio. I am the program manager for Frederick Community College. I actually would like to share that I am not sure if I actually submitted my te oral testimony accurately. Um, as well, I am with Dr. Rebecca Miner from the Community College of Baltimore County. Uh, we are both in favor of this bill with amendments. So I am not sure how you would like me to proceed, if you would like me to speak or just have Dr. Miner speak in behalf of the system. Oh, Please, we like to do favorable, but please continue. Then we'll stop and take questions. Absolutely. Um, so again, like I shared, I am the program manager for the Frederick Community College Interpreter Prep Program. Dr. Rebecca Miner, who's the program director at Community College of Baltimore County. We are both in favor of this bill with a few amendments. We feel that our programs are important to note that we are the only two programs in the state of Maryland that train and prep interpreters to work with the deaf community. Deaf people need well-trained interpreters to provide them with accessibility per their rights following outlined in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Our programs provide students with uh, an Associates of Applied Science in interpreting. However, our graduates um, to obtain a national certification need to actually obtain a baccalaureate degree. This licensing uh, procedure established that by the bill is, independent on inter is dependent on interpreters obtaining national certification through the Registry of Interpreters through the Deaf. In order to sit for the test through the register through RID, for the, um, candidates must hold a minimum of a baccalaureate degree or equivalent of 120 credits. CCBC as well as uh, FCC are in support of CCBC potentially obtaining uh, an uh, applied baccalaureate degree so that students in the state of Maryland can continue with their educational learning. Maryland currently has no regulations which determine who can market themselves as an interpreter. Sadly, Maryland deaf citizens often find themselves in situations where the interpreter that was hired for their appointment, whether it be a doctor's appointment, a college class, a job interview, or others, are not qualified and in many cases have never been trained um, and does not actually know American Sign Language. Some deaf children who are mainstream in Maryland's K through 12 system are being exposed to unqualified language models. And this is stagnating their cognitive development and they unfortunately have no voice. So we understand that this bill is an attempt to set up an aggressive licensing procedure, which will protect the deaf children and adults in the state of Maryland. We support the concept of this licensure and support this view with a few minor changes. There are three specific points that we would like to have um, request to be amended. On page six, line 25, it currently reads a medical, should read, I, we were requesting that it says a medical setting unless the individual is accompanied by a licensed sign language interpreter. There, our focus on this is that we are specifically overseeing interns. And if an intern can enter emergency medical situation setting, they should also be welcomed into routine medical settings with supervision. The second amendment that we would request is on page six, line 28. We would like to add, unless the individual is accompanied by a licensed sign language interpreter. This is a way Dr. for us- Dr. Puzio, you've reached your time. Can you get to your third uh, amendment point? Yes, sir. It is page six, line 29. We would like to add, unless the individual is accompanied by a sign, uh, licensed sign language interpreter. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, since we sort of melded the favorable and the favorable with amendments, I'm just gonna run through the rest of the favor with amendments and then open it up for questions. Um, let's go to uh, Michelle Westfall, please. Ms. Westfall, yes. The interpreter needs to pin Ms. West, Ms. Westfall. One. Can we spotlight Ms. Second. Westfall and her interpreter? I'm not able to, I can, this is the interpreter. Who's Mrs. Westfall's I, interpreter? The, the Wait, we don't need to spotlight the interpreter. We just need, or yeah, we just need to spotlight Ms. Westfall. Okay, got it. For the YouTube. Okay, hopefully we're a go, please. Okay, fantastic, thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Michelle Westfall. I am the acting chair of the Maryland Advisory Council on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, M-A-C-D-H-H is the acronym we go by. And our position is in support with amendments of the current bill. Three pieces of feedback I'd like the committee to consider. The first being 
the Maryland One Stop website. Maryland currently has other agencies who are able to distribute or ensure licensures that fit with their particular subject matter expertise. And because of that, we feel that the governor's office of the deaf and hard of hearing ODHH or GODHH should be the ones to facilitate and administer the interpreter licensing program. And the reason for that, of course, is pretty obvious. They have the, for lack of a better word, strong subject matter expertise and cultural competence when it comes to the community. The Department of Labor does not have that same level of expertise. The Department of Health, the Department of Transportation, so forth and so on, other agencies all can issue licensures. So it seems that ODHH should be able to do in kind. Second amendment we'd like to consider is the, related to the fiscal and policy note. The analysts did point out that there was some confusion within the bill about who would be administering the bill. If you have, for example, ODHH as the only entity administering it in lieu of its current, the way it's currently written being under the Department of Labor and then administered by ODHH, I think that would reduce some of that confusion. Also, I'd like to refer to the joint chair report from 2020 and the response that ODHH made to that report. I'm in favor of option one out of the five options were, that were included in that joint chair report. There is no one on the Maryland Interpreter Licensing Committee that consulted with anyone on the Maryland Advisory Council for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing at any time in the development of this bill. And so therefore, to be completely honest, we were actually surprised to find ourselves listed within the body and the language of the bill as being proposed as a possible board member for the development of the board. The community members of the advisory council feel very, very strongly that we should not be proposed as a representative on the board. And we would like to see that removed. We would like to see Maryland Advisory Council of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing removed as a possible board representation. We also feel that... Um, could you begin to wrap up, please? We also feel that all the board members should be more general and not represent specific organizations as it's listed in the bill. So, for example, there's deaf and interpreting organizations listed, and we feel that, you know there should no be, not be any specific organizations named in terms of board representation. That way nobody is accidentally left out. So just three pieces of feedback we'd like the committee to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, uh, favorable with amendments on this minor. Uh, obviously, Dr. Puzio has already spoken. Um, if you can be brief, we usually uh, limit it to two favorable with amendments. So uh, uh, Ms. Minor. Then we'll Can you spotlight the interpreter and me, please? Interpreter Anna. And you can take the spotlight off of Ms. Westfall. Ms. Stanton, please go to Ms. Minor and interpreter Anna. I am getting Ms. Minor right now. Great. Thank you, honorable representatives, for hearing our testimony today. As Dr. Puzio already said, myself and her, we wrote the testimony together, and I just want to clarify a couple things at the, uh, about the amendments in our testimony. My name is Dr. Rebecca Miner. I am the program director for the Community College of Baltimore County's ASL and interpreting program. We have been training interpreters at CCBC since 1983. So this program has a long history in preparing interpreters to work with deaf people. As Dr. Puzio said, FCC and CCBC's programs are the only two programs in the, state, in the state that teach interpreting. There are lots of other programs that teach the language, which can be used in a variety of other settings and as just uh, life enrichment learning. We are the only two programs that are career-based training to provide training in becoming an interpreter. 
we are in support of this bill. We hope you will pass this bill. Our deaf people in Maryland deserve better and they need protection. The only things that we request to be amended in the bill are three lines in which the bill outlines where interns can work. Since we are the ones training intern interpreters, we would like a little more flexibility to be able to let interns in with supervision alongside a certified interpreter in routine medical settings, education settings, as well as in VRI, video remote interpreting. The video remote interpreting piece is a little confusing because I'm not sure that the bill really uh, defines what video remote interpreting is because before the, pand the corona pandemic, um, video remote interpreting was a very specific kind of interpreting when the hospital would bring in a tv on a cart and you know the, the person in the emergency room could get the interpreter immediately because it was on a television screen now as you can see today we have an interpreter who is working remotely and for me all of my interns this semester are working remotely so i would like the ability to train them with supervision when working remotely um, all of these requests, these three requests for amendments would be just ways to help keep it flexible and help keep us help us to still be able to train interpreters. And I also just echo what Dr. Puzio said. We are the only two programs. We are associate of applied science programs, career-based training programs, and there is no baccalaureate in the state. The licensure certification required in this bill does require a bachelor's degree or equivalent of 120 credits. In my program uh, alone, Ms. students Minor, close you've got to, to conclude. credits. So in my program alone, students are here for four years and earn just under 100. Thank you, Ms. Minor. We're, we're really out of time. Thank you. Okay, uh, question for any of the favorables or favorable with amendments. Uh, seeing no hands, um, we will move on. There is no opposition. So thank all of you for your contribution and your patience. Uh, sorry about the technical glitches. Um, thank you, our committee will consider the bill and thank you, Madam Sponsor. That concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 431. We will move to Senate Bill 39, Senator Ellis, uh, testifying um, with Senator Ellis uh, is uh, Dr. Ronald Garrett, uh, Katina Burks, Ralph Cyrus III, and Sheila Bryant. Uh, please, um, Senator Ellis, uh, you're on. Thank you, Chairman Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, members of my esteemed Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. I'm Arthur Ellis, representing Charles County District 28 in the Senate of Maryland. And I bring before you this bill have to do with all the consequences that uh, uh, the formerly incarcerated, incarcerated face uh, during their lifetime and to get a clear understanding of what those consequences are. And uh, Lamorio, if you have that presentation, uh, if you can uh, start the presentation, please. While that happens, uh, over the years living in Charles County, I uh, met this elderly gentleman is close to 70 years old now hardest working person around. Um, um, he just did a lot of odd jobs in the county. I know he did odd jobs for me. But I want something heavy to lift or, you know, grass cut, uh, and I'm not able to spend the time to do it. He'll be there for eight, maybe 10, 12 hours. Great reputation for work. I asked him one day, why um, all these odd jobs, these uh, day laborer jobs? And he said, well, you know, <laughs> I got in trouble when I was a young man in my high teens, early 20s. And I spent uh, some time in prison and it's almost impossible for me to get anything to do. And that really had me thinking that, uh, you know, um, and reading up on former incarcerated, all the limitations on them. And so I bring before this bill, Senate Bill 39, which will ask for a study at the State Department of Planning uh, in coordination with the Maryland State Data Center to study, report on, and make recommendations related to certain collateral, con collateral consequences for individuals with criminal records. Uh, Senator Ellis? Yes, sir. 
Um, did you say you had a, a PowerPoint or a slide? I thought I did. Um, a Miss Stanton? No, I never received one. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Well. Okay. Please okay, continue. You. Okay. Great. Thank you. So this bill requires the Department of Planning to uh, do a study on collateral damages, consequences for individuals with criminal records. That means individuals who are limited or prohibited from doing uh, certain um, citizens function because of their past criminal record. Uh, some of those uh, collateral, collateral consequences we know about is the right to vote. And fortunately in Maryland, uh, a few years back, we gave uh, the formerly incarcerated the right to vote, but there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of other limitations and restrictions out there uh, in Maryland um, that the formerly incarcerated have to uh, deal with throughout their lifetime. Like that gentleman I explained to you uh, earlier in his uh, senior years, but you know, hardworking, he realized he made, um, how should I say, bad mistakes as a young man and paid for his entire life uh, for those mistakes. So this bill would study um, what are those restrictions that the formerly incarcerated have. Restrictions on employment in certain professions and policies, practices and statistics regarding private employers in the state and hiring individuals with criminal records. We'll study restrictions on the ability to obtain certain business, occupational and professional licenses, including a liquor license. And I put the example of liquor license in this bill because um, a couple of years ago, uh, we did a revision to a certain liquor bill and that restriction was in there. I'm like, oh my goodness. Uh, if and someone has a, a felony record, they cannot own a liquor license in Maryland. So the question is what else can not they do? And so we need to know, and this uh, bill would uh, create that study. It also, study the restrictions on the receipt of public assistance, including federal state grants, federal cash assistance, food assistance, and public housing. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, restrictions on international travel. Um, some folks uh, might be impacted in uh, going on vacations with their family, uh, international destinations. Parental rights, impact on parental rights, and of course, uh, last jury duty. And so these are just, uh, handful of uh, some of the areas. Anecdotally, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of restrictions. And so we would like uh, a consolidated report on all these restrictions. And with knowledge comes the ability to do something about it, to help uh, our citizens to reintegrate in society and to be functioning members of society. I strongly believe that mistakes someone make any time in their life should not be a lifetime prison sentence and exclusion from uh, being great citizens in Maryland. So colleagues, I ask for your uh, at, um, attention to this bill and for your favorable recommendation to get this study done so we can understand all the consequences of uh, collateral, collateral consequences of individuals who uh, face uh, uh, prison uh, jail time and what they can do and cannot do in our society. Mr. Chairman, Thank I you. return. Thank you, Senator. Uh, let's go to Dr. Garrett, please. Uh, apparently he's muted at our end or your end. He's not muted. Dr. Garrett? He must have stepped away, but all of no, his- uh, he, he's, he's there. Uh, yeah. Garrett, uh, we can't hear you. <sighs> Dr. Garrett? No, still not. He's unmuted at our end, uh, Ms. Stanton. He is. He's unmuted and his video is showing. So I'm, he might have stepped away from the computer. No. no, he's right there. Yeah, you're on. We just can't hear you, uh, Dr. Garrett. 
uh, why don't we come back to you? We'll go on to one of the other proponents. Uh, let's go to um, Ms. Burks. Hi, good afternoon, Chairman Penske, members of the EHE committee and senators. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My name is Katina Burks, a graduate student at Howard University studying social work, community administration and policy practice. And I also work with the returning citizens at the Damascus House, the only transitional house housing facility here in Prince George's County. As a relative of a returning citizen and an advocate for the citizens within my community, I am here today in favor of Senate Bill 39 because it could enhance the lives of returning citizens. Currently, there are laws that restrict the livelihood of a vast majority in this population. As a direct witness of someone who has completed their punishment for his crimes, my brother reintegration was beyond difficult. And that was with family support. So just imagine someone with no family support. He was unable to live with, his, live with us, but he was also unable to live in subsidized housing due to his criminal past and the restrictions. In addition to housing, finding employment that would afford him a living wage was almost non-existent. So the next best thing for him to do was to become an entre entrepreneur, you would think. Well, no. There he found another set of roadblocks of restrictions obtained, uh, another set of roadblocks that would prevent him from obtain, obtaining certain licensures. So as a direct witness, <clears throat> it does not only affect the person returning, but it also affects the family. So <clears throat> I am here asking today that you guys support this bill so that we can do the research or the research can be done and stop the domino effect and possibly stop the pay the roads that's been paved to recidivism. Again, I'm at, I, I'm so sorry, you guys. Again, I am in support of Senate Bill 39, and I'm asking you, uh, you all to support it. Thank you for your time. No, thank you, Ms. Burks. Um, thank you. Let's go back, um, Dr. Garrett. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not hearing, let, Doc. I can, let me see if I can try and contact him uh, via cell phone, uh, Senator Penske, and I'll get back to you. Okay, um, there's something beyond your mute and unmute button, uh, Dr. Garrett, that's prohibiting us hearing you. We'll come back to you one more time. Uh, let's go to uh, Ralph Cyrus III, please. Hello, hello, can you hear me? We can, we can. All right. Good afternoon, Chairman Pitsky and members of the Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. I speak today to offer my support to Senate Bill 39 and to urge the state of Maryland to take the first steps in lifting the undue burdens placed on individuals with criminal records from being productive members of society. Individuals with criminal records should not have to continually face punishment after the terms of their sentences have been fulfilled often facing roadblocks in accessing housing, labor opportunities, occupational licensing, education, voting, and other forms of civic participation. These barriers run counter to the purpose of rehabilitation that their sentences would seemingly going to conduct. With Merlin having one of the highest rates of incarceration for young black people in this nation, this is a matter of racial justice and human rights. Right under our nose is an entire underclass of fellow Marylanders who are relegated to second class citizen status and are effectively barred from positive reintegration back into society. As a collective, we do not even consider the harm that we put on the formerly incarcerated due to the persistent belief in continual punishment. They are often treated as less than human, but they are human. They are our fellow Marylanders, neighbors, and often members of our own family including my own. It is about time we reckon with that and treat them as such. There has been a substantial movement this recent decade to restore the rights of individuals with criminal records, both here in Maryland and nationwide, from restoring the right to vote, to banning labor and housing discrimination on applications, to creating incentives for employers to hire the formerly incarcerated. But there needs to be concrete studies on the wholesale impact these consequences have on their lives. I urge the committee to give a favorable report to SB 39 and urge its passing through this chamber. 
Thank you so much for your time and have a blessed day. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cyrus. Let's try you again, Dr. Garrett. Hopefully we have uh, audio. Okay, do we have audio this time? Perfect. You, can? you can hear me now? I'm on, yes. I'm on my phone. I don't know what has happened with my computer, but nevertheless, I really appreciate um, you all giving me the opportunity to share with you this afternoon. Uh, in relation to SB 39, I would first like to lead with the fact that I am, I am myself a returning citizen that served 20 years in the Georgia Department of Corrections. Uh, during that time, I was able to have access to secondary education and earn a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate in uh, chaplaincy services pre-release. Having the ability to do these things and having the financial, the family support that I was connected with upon my reentry, allowed me to circumvent many of the barriers that face most returning citizens who are coming home uh, today here in Maryland. Um, barriers such as opposition to employment, uh, certifications that are necessary, licensures that are necessary for certain careers, as Senator Ellis pointed out for something like uh, owning, having a liquor license. Uh, persons who have served their time uh, in our nation's prisons uh, should not be continued to be held back and, and not become a integral part of the community if that is what they so desire to do. Um, I have served as the regional reentry coordinator uh, for the Welcome Home Reentry Mentoring Program with Catholic Charities in Washington, DC. And we oversee the DC area as well as uh, Prince George's County in, in particular. I cannot tell you that countless numbers of individuals who come home from serving time in prison, who have the attitude to do the right thing, who have the intellect to do the right thing, who have the wherewithal to get out here and become contributing members to society, but who are barred from doing those things for things such as they can't even uh, fill, out a, fill out a rental application and they are denied the ability to rent an apartment, even though they are gainfully employed, even though they clearly can afford it, they are denied simply because there's a felony on their record. And I believe that this panel and uh, those who are gonna be voting today uh, should definitely pass Senate Bill 39 uh, so that we can eliminate the collateral consequences for individuals with criminal records. I am, I am not an anomaly. Uh, and able to have accomplished the things that I've been able to do as a returning citizen. It has only been by the grace of God and my family support, but there are countless numbers of returning citizens who did not come home to a family support network that had the ability to assist them in overcoming the numerous barriers that are in place in our society today. Thank you for uh, the time and your patience with me this afternoon. No, uh... Thank you, Dr. Uh, Garrett. Let's go to Ms. Bryant and then we'll take uh, questions for the proponents. I have no uh, opponents signed up, uh, Ms. Bryant. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Penske and members of the committee. My name is Sheila Bryant and I'm a member of Progressive Maryland's uh, Prince George's County Justice Task Force. I'm a resident of Upper Marlboro, Maryland. You know, every year citizens return from periods of incarceration to face a world that's different from the one they knew before. Once they re-enter society, they're faced with obstacles which prevent them from fully realizing their potential because they come back to his hostility and doors slammed in their faces. We have little substantive data to know what the true consequences are for those with a criminal record looking for paths to re-entry. Progressive Maryland recently had a forum on Saturday, which provided an opportunity for some affected individuals to share their lived experience as returning citizens. It was heart-wrenching to hear about the homelessness, loneliness, isolation, and hopelessness that it's an experience shared by so many. Women especially spoke of having nowhere to go for help, ineligible for public assistance and housing, unable to renew licenses they held before, difficulty regaining custody of their children. And there was one man who told us a story of coming home and expecting that his mother would welcome him, only to find that her senior community would only allow him to live in her home 14 days a year. This was the 
his only connection to the community. So when even his own mother couldn't provide temporary housing, he was left living in his car with a hope, with no hope, no help, no money, no job. How do we expect for him to survive? He told us that he was on the verge as many in his circumstances are of finding the answer by going back to the criminal activity that landed him behind bars. This happens day in and day out, but there is no real data to tell us what the impacts are. You cannot fix what you don't measure. That's why this bill is so important. We have a vested interest in ensuring and helping prevent recidivism and keep our communities safe while also allowing a meaningful expectation that returning citizens can actually survive, prosper and thrive after paying their debt to society. We need the information from the study to see what the collateral consequences are and recommendations on how to fix them. That is why I'm asking for your support of Senate Bill 39. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bryant. Uh, questions for any of the proponents of the legislation introduced by Senator Ellis? Uh, Senator Carrozza. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the uh, Senate sponsor, Senator Ellis, and his panel. Um, my question is more, um, I think, just trying to understand um, not so much the purpose of the information, but how we would gather the information. Um, I read through the letter um, from the Maryland Department of Planning, and they indicate in their letter that they don't have data on individuals with criminal records. And, and so I, I guess kind of some of these issues, I know we've worked in other committees, Senate you know, Judicial Proceedings Committee. So I'm, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, I think I understand um, the content, um, the information that is being sought, but it looks like from carefully reading the Maryland Department of Planning um, letter of information that um, they, do not have this information and would have to probably, um, you know, subcontract it out um, to produce the information. So it, it could be something we want to um, follow up with after the hearing, but I, I did want to flag that at this point uh, that that was in the file. Um, Thank you, yeah. Senator Carosa. Senator Ellis, you want to comment? Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So yeah, I uh, went through that also. And that letter from them is a testament, uh, Senator Carrozza, the need for this bill. Uh, the status shocking is not available. Um, and so they know to go to different agencies and to really staff this, uh, um, hopefully it will be a law to really um, gather the data, it's out there. You know, this is the era of big data. You know, we have, it's, um, it's scattered throughout the bureaucracy and we want them to find the information, to give it to us so we can take action on fixing some of the things that are wrong with just uh, pushing uh, return citizens into um, non-citizenship forever. And so uh, it's, it'll be difficult on them to really gather the data. That's why I felt this bill, well, it needs to be a law because it will require um, um, them to really expend some energy, the Maryland Department of Planning, them, uh, to really get this uh, information to us so we can be informed and we can, you know, take uh, appropriate action legislatively going forward. Senator Fry Hester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my, my question is similar to uh, Senator Carrozza's and, and um, I think that this is a, we really do need to have this data in order to make good decisions. Um, I, I think it may be spread out all over the entire state, Senator Ellis, which I think is the point of your bill. Um, and so I was just curious if, if we were able to get the data, but in, in some other way from some other agency, like, or the governor's office, would, would that suffice 
And I mean, it's not really about the Maryland Department of Data uh, Planning. It's about having the information so we can make good policy decisions. Is that correct? That is correct. And right, okay. uh, I know the governor, there's a uh, link in the uh, um, uh, testimony to, uh, um, to a report from a panel the government empowered, uh, the governor empowered a couple of years ago and, but that was very limited uh, to a limited area. And so the thing is, uh, you know, uh, how do we find this information? How do we gather it to be comprehensive, to be, um, how should I say, uh, all inclusive? And, and so basically that's the purpose of, uh, you know, uh, this bill to empower the Department of Planning to, uh, to um, give us the, uh, uh, footwork necessary to get and gather this information. They, and you mentioned, uh, and uh, you did mention that it's probably all over mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the state. It's, uh, you know, because there's so many restrictions. Uh, I can't speak to how many and where, but the bill lists a few examples of the restrictions. And they're in the Department of Labor, they're in the Department mm -hmm. of Housing and Community Development, they're just all over. And so we want to pull all that uh, together in one concise A grade, A plus grade paper for us to really do A plus work in those areas that we need reformation. You know, the no brainers, we can, you know, take care of that really quick. Some areas will be more, require more thoughtful uh, uh, legislation and, uh, and a harder, heavier lift but we just need to gather all this information and to understand exactly what the problem is and how far reaching it is. I think uh, that, that has implications, Senator Freihester. Obviously, if there's another way to approach this, as long as we get the data, I think is partly what I hear. I'm gonna to go to Senator Washington. I think I saw a hand go up. One quick question or comment, Senator Ellis. You know, in the uh, in the charge, the Department of Planning, it, besides gathering the data, it uh, suggests them coming up with recommendations. Um, I I wouldn't bet the house on the recommendations. Uh, most agencies will probably say they implement the law rather than create it. Um, I, look, I, I'd love to have great recommendations for making reforms. Um, I guess I wouldn't be overly optimistic that the kind of reforms you're looking for would come from that agency or to be honest, many other agencies. So that's just, you know, free two cents uh, of uh, my experience up here, um, which you can answer or not. Let's get a Senator Washington. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Senator Ellis for bringing this bill. Uh, I think I have a, a question either for the chair or for committee staff. I, I'm curious about what part of the code this is written to, um, cause I'm having used to be, I, as you remember, I spent a year in JPR and normally these types of bills come to JPR and I, I've been familiar with some of those. Again, not trying to kick the can cause the, the issues are broad enough and certainly education health uh, and sort of what we do. But I'm just curious what section of the, sort of why, why we got it. I guess. If, uh, committee council, I assume you're on who, handles uh, this. Uh, do you have an answer for Senator Washington when there is a task force? Is it still written to a code or in, a, in whether it's education or procurement in the uh, Maryland uh, annotated code? It was going to be um, uncodified, right? So it's not going to amend um, any of the law that's already there. So the specifics mm -hmm. of Department of Planning, I'll have to check and see that's what it is. how that's yeah connected to our <laughs> umbrella, um, but it'll just relate to the Department of, of Planning's umbrella in general. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank, that's what I thought. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, Dr. Garrett, we're, we're, gonna, we're a little late now, and I think uh, the Senator's sponsor spoke to answering the question. Um, are there other questions from the panel? Okay, seeing none, uh, seeing no opposition, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 39. Thank you, Senator Ellis and all the witnesses and your patience. Uh, that concludes the hearing. We're gonna move to Senate Bill 66, Senator Elfrith. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, uh, and just so people are ready afterwards, uh, John Hardigan, uh, Dr. Felicia Williams, um, Andrew Coy, and Kevin Cornegay. Then we'll stop and take uh, questions. Then we'll move to favor with amendments, John Horner and Dakota Matthews. Uh, please welcome Senator. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the, the committee. I'm here for the record, Senator Sarah Elfworth here to present Senate Bill 66. Um, it's, it's 2021 and yet uh, half a million Marylanders still don't have access to reliable broadband. And I think, I, I know, because I've spoken with many of you individually, over the last 11 months, uh, each of you has worked with your communities to try to solve this problem. And anecdotally, we all have stories of how it's impacted our varying communities very similarly. Um, I think COVID has exposed kind of two truths here. We have two economies that have emerged and highlighted deep economic divides within our communities. And, and two, and this very hearing is an example of this, the internet um, is, is not a luxury anymore. It's a way of life. It's a utility. And that's why I'm proud to present Senate Bill 66 today to try to resolve this issue for our community members. I'd like to specifically thank um, Senators uh, Addie Eckerd and uh, Hester for working with me from the beginning of this, of this effort. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe the House hearing had something like 60 witnesses and um, I, obviously we can't do that, but I do wanna alert the committee to uh, the favorable uh, uh, testimony you have in front of you from groups like the USM, the community colleges, libraries, Maryland Municipal League, uh, Maryland Association of Counties, AFSCME, ACLU, the Hospital Association, the Catholic Church, uh, the Greater Balt Baltimore Committee and more. And Mr. Chair, I don't think I've ever had uh, presented a bill with so much varying support on such an urgent issue. I'd also like to take a moment and say that we've been working, uh, we pre-filed this bill and since then have been working with folks um, like Comcast and like the Rural Maryland Council to amend and strengthen the bill. You also have those amendments in your inboxes as well. Uh, we know that closing the digital divide is important for many reasons. Um, whether it's a student in kindergarten or a student studying for the PhD, a farmer on the shore, um, important for our telemedicine as we've shifted uh, to that structure over the last 11 months, important for small businesses to thrive in this economy. Being connected has never been so important in the history of the world. And yet we have a lot of gaps in our system. What this bill does is it builds off the incredible work of the Governor's Office of Rural Broadband. Um, I know they've done work in many of our communities, including the southern part of my district. I represent a, a district that is kind of unique. It has a very urban component, very suburban, and then I have rural components. And the Governor's Office has done a great job at connecting communities, particularly on the shore, um, with opportunities and working with, with uh, the municipalities and the counties to connect connect uh, the rural communities. But we also know that, that Suburban and urban communities also have similar and some different uh, challenges as, as it comes to being connected. So the bill expands this office, it codifies this office, uh, it's not in our law right now, into the Office of Digital Connectivity. Um, and I know we know this anecdotally, but just a couple data points here. In Baltimore City, 41% of residents don't have access to reliable internet. In the DC metro area, 20% of households. In rural communities that are, a, a, below the state average income, it's 33% of, of houses that don't have reliable high-speed internet. And in rural counties above average household income, 22% don't have high-speed internet subscriptions. This is a problem that I, I mentioned impacts all of our communities. Um, the bill expands the Office of Rural Broadband, preserves 99% of it functions, its functions, and then builds from there. So it would create the Office of Digital Connectivity, um, and we're, we're hoping with the same, very same staff that have uh, done an incredible job for the Governor's Office of Rural Broadband, um, but it makes sure that its work covers statewide. It's intended to be a central hub for the state because this is such an intersectional policy challenge that we want this office to work closely with the Department of Commerce, with libraries, with the Department of Health, with county offices for workforce development and coordinate resources and services to connect our communities with the internet. Um, it's also gonna be a central hub to apply for and efficiently utilize the federal funding that we know is coming down the pipeline. It's a priority for President Biden. It's a priority for this Congress uh, to get our communities connected. There will be billions of dollars in funding. And right now, Maryland is not as well equipped to apply for and utilize that funding as we could be 
if we had the statewide office. 27 other states have statewide offices to do this. This is putting us in line with them and making us more competitive than we were yesterday. Um, finally, the, the, it doesn't just create the office. It also says that we need to do, we need to do our homework. Again, anecdotally, each one of us has stories of our own communities with this challenge, but it's going to take uh, it's two publicly facing data points, working with the locals to build on existing feasibility plans. And then it's gonna do, it's gonna take an audit of the problems and map those issues, including speed, affordability, and availability across the state. And again, set up our, our communities for this federal funding we know is coming. Um, Mr. Chair, I have some technical experts on the witness panel who can answer the technical questions and explain this from a technical perspective. I'm a layperson who has just spent a lot of months on this one bill as a, I think, common sense solution. Um, it's not immediate. It's saying that we need to uh, audit, map, and set ourselves up for success working with our communities. Um, again, this pandemic's only exacerbated socioeconomic divides. Um, and this, one of the starkest examples we have is our ability for children, families, and seniors to be connected digitally. So I ask that the Senate give, this committee give Senate Bill 66 a favorable report um, so that no zip code can be left behind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Elfrith. Uh, let me remind everyone, and this is not to minimize their input, there is no opposition to the bill. And as the Senator uh, shared, um, hold on, hold on. Um, as the Senator shared, um, there are two or three pages of written testimony. So with that, we're going to uh, John Harrigan followed by Dr. Williams. Thank you, Senator Pinsky, and thank you, Senator Elfrith. My name is John Horrigan. I have conducted with the support of the ABLE Foundation and the Community Development Network of Maryland a report called Disconnected in Maryland, which tries to characterize the nature of the digital divide in Maryland. The report focuses on a specific component of the digital divide, which is the broadband adoption gap, which is whether consumers choose to subscribe to wireline broadband service at home. Why the focus on wireline? Well, wireline is the kind of robust access that enables people to do homework, enables people to engage in telehealth sessions and enables them uh, or their children to log on to school. Senator Elfrith hit a few data points in the study, but I wanna just reiterate them. 520,000 Maryland households do not have a home wireline subscription. And since it's no good to have a wireline connection unless you have a computing device to get online, it's worth pointing out that nearly 400,000 Maryland homes do not have a desktop or laptop computer to go on the internet with. So, and that's 18% of all Maryland households. The biggest gaps in broadband adoption play out along lines of race and poverty. Out of the 520,000 Maryland homes without a wireline broadband connection, 206,000 are African-American households. Low-income households also bear the burden. They're about half as likely to have service as well-off households. It's also the case that most of this broadband adoption gap plays out in Maryland's metro and urban areas. 342,000 disconnected are in metro counties or Baltimore City. Now, it's important to emphasize that, yes, there are broadband adoption gaps in rural Maryland. Allegheny and Garrett counties, for example, have broadband adoption rates that are on par with Baltimore cities, which is very low, uh, both in comparison with within the state and in other similar cities around the country. So what can we do to try to close these gaps? The report does point to a few things that the state can do, some of which have already been mentioned. One is to develop partnerships for digital inclusion. Um, the state should consider investments in digital inclusion, partnering with pr the private sector and philanthropic organizations. This can be done through the Office of Digital Inclusion that uh, this bill proposes. It's also important for there to be statewide planning. Other states have embarked on this since the pandemic and to have a comprehensive plan to chart out Maryland's broadband future would be important. It's also important to increase public awareness of affordability programs. The private sector has stepped up across the country and in Maryland to provide discounted internet offerings 
oftentimes a difficulty is getting the word out to communities that need to hear about this. So promoting awareness and investing in that with community institutions is important. And finally, we need to improve the pipeline of computing devices. As I noted, there are hundreds of thousands of Maryland homes who don't have a computer to get online with and to get computers to those households in an affordable way is important. There are initiatives underway in that regard in the state. And so there's some ample experience to build upon and I would encourage stakeholders to do that. And with that, I will uh, conclude and be available for any questions that may arise later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrigan. Uh, let's now have the uh, fairly new president of uh, Prince George's Community College, Dr. Williams, welcome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Senator Penske, Senator Alfred, and to the, and to the committee. Uh, as the relatively new, five months old now, president for Prince George's Community College, I want to offer my strong support for Senate Bill 66, the Digital Connectivity Act of 2021. The issues in our nation and state uh, surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially with regard to access to digital technologies and internet services, were prominent prior to the onset of the global pandemic. Without the state's deliberate investment in infrastructure and operations to close these untenable gaps, our students and communities will continue to lack reliable internet access for learning and for performing basic life tasks. The establishment of the Office of Digital Inclusion in the Department of Housing and Community Development is a foundational investment for closing the digital divide. Prince George's Community College serves nearly 35,000 students, 96% of which are students of color. In March of 2020, we converted more than 95% of our enterprises operations to remote instruction. Like our K-12 partners and the vast majority of higher education institutions, we have responded to these challenges utilizing the resources at our disposals. Several hundred students have been issued laptops, hotspots, and more than 2,600 have also received direct support scholarships as a result of generous philanthropic support. The real challenge is we have now surveyed our students from the spring of 2020, the summer of 2020, and the fall of 2020 to see how they are progressing. There's good news to be told. There's good news in that our students are developing more agency and proficiency in learning online. There's good news in that the actual direct support is helpful. There's good news in that the devices are helpful. But there's one metric that is discouraging, and that is the metric that relays to us their level of stable access to internet. And we are seeing that actually that, that metric is declining. So more and more, our students are having more challenges in being able to gain stable access to internet. So I say to you that it is extremely important among all the things that we do, uh, that we not neglect the need to address the intersectionality and the complexity of ensuring that all of our residents, including our students at Prince George's Community College, have stable and reliable, it should be ubiquitous access to internet to internet. So I offer my full support for this legislation as an essential component towards the mitigating of long-term impacts of digital inequities in education and in life. I thank you for this time. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, let's go to Andrew Coy, followed by Kevin Cornegay, then we'll take questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Andrew Coyne, the Executive Director of the Digital Harbor Foundation. It's an honor to speak to you on this important issue here today. Uh, as you've heard from my fellow uh, uh, colleagues that have provided testimony and from Senator Elthrith, this is a major issue. Uh, we all see it and know it. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to highlight uh, in the bill that I think are of particular note that have been highlighted, but I just want to underscore and add uh, additional emphasis to them. One is the ability for a codified office to provide long-term planning. This is essential for us to be competitive. Uh, and as was highlighted earlier, there is federal funding. You know, it, as of the, the most recent uh, uh, bill that has been passed on uh, additional federal funding, we have now a program called the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. This is being administered, but the issue with us as it relates to Marylanders is this is a program that you have to apply for and have to then receive. It is not uh, being distributed just to any state that, that uh, uh, in a block uh, grant format. So we need to have an ability to communicate with our residents and help them receive this in order for those funds to come here to Maryland and benefit Marylanders. Um, additionally, we need to have uh, other types of statewide coordination and convening to help us be better positioned for other resources and opportunities that are currently available or will be available in the near term future. Uh, this is of critical importance that without the office of a, a statewide office, 
uh, of, the, of digital inclusion, we will be poorly positioned to be competitive as a state. Uh, third, uh, data reporting. Anecdotally, we hear there, there are various problems, but we need to have the ability, this is the role that government plays uh, and needs to play, of being a, a data uh, a repository in a place that can have definitive information about access. Uh, anecdotally, we've seen and heard stories that even refer to digital redlining and other problems that cut across lines that have deep racial and, and historical uh, uh, importance. And, and we need to, to have better insight and to be able to make plans uh, as, a, as a state uh, to address these, these issues where they do exist. Uh, finally, I'd like to highlight that, you know, when we think about internet access, we, we do obviously think of major uh, providers, but there are a number of gap network providers. And this term is a relatively recent term coined by, or I heard at least from Angela Seifer, the executive director of the Na National Digital Inclusion Alliance. And there are lots of players that do exist in this space and an office such as this, uh, which I've had the opportunity to work, work with Director Rick Gordon in the past, I think will be well positioned to support a growing number of options for Marylanders to be able to have the best service possible. And so with that, I uh, request a favorable, favorable report on Senate Bill 66 and thank you for your time and the work on this important issue. Thank you, Mr. Coy. Um, uh, Mr. Cornegay. Is Mr. Cornegay with us? He was initially with us, um, Senator Penske. I'm not finding him right now. Okay, let's um, let's stop. And before we go to Fable with amendments, there is one or there are two uh, questions for the proponents. Uh, Senator Carrozza. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I just want to thank the uh, sponsor and the uh, panel. This is one area where all of our constituencies have recognized the need for um, broadband access and uh, across the board, whether it's telehealth, telework, um, education. Um, and so I understand, obviously, we, we want to be organized um, in, you know, and, and looking at our governmental structure with this. I guess one of my questions, and, and I think it was maybe for the last um, uh, oral um, testimony we just heard, um, would just like to, he, he mentioned the long, the need for long range planning on this um, shared priority for all of our constituents. I, I'd like his thoughts on when he mentioned the long range planning, uh, you know, how we can make sure that we're being, um, knowing that we have budget constraints, how we can be most efficient and also how we can be fair to all um, constituencies, um, especially since we've highlighted some of the, the rural challenges as well. Uh, yes, I, I'm happy to speak to that briefly. One of the things I think the Office of Rural Broadband, as it's currently constituted, has done really well is to work with local jurisdictions on understanding and, and coming up with plans for how they will use some of their own resources as well. Uh, so the office has engaged a number of jurisdictions in doing local plans. There are multiple streams of funds, not just state dollars, that I think are and can go towards this. But with the state support in planning and and uh, mapping out how best to, to deploy those, we'll be better positioned. So, you know, I do think that there need to be more resources from the state. I think this is an area that uh, I would see bipartisan support. And I know we're in a tight uh, budgetary uh, environment, but I do think that given the importance of this in this moment, as that's been highlighted, uh, and the long-term investment benefit uh, in terms of attracting uh, business, uh, of, of supporting businesses that exist here in Maryland uh, and competing uh, nationally. There's lots of uh, ways in which I think this has a return on investment, but the important role of the planning, uh, I think is a role that the office, uh, a statewide office will be uniquely positioned to support and be able to make investments that are hard to otherwise make, um, you know, from, from perhaps local dollars, given the, the interrelated nature of the internet as infrastructure. Senator Simon Ayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Senator, for coming before us again. Um, I appreciate your bill. Um, when I'm looking at this, I will say one is um, this is one of the Republicans' priorities for this uh, this session. Um, we really believe this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, I think the educational aspect brought it to light, but also people are working from home, the health, and also I appreciate you bringing it forward. 
but the one question I have is, you know, I think, as we've said in our caucus, we need bold action on this. And I'm trying to look at the what the office will do. And I was briefly reading through it. it says it's going to develop definitions and standards. It's going to collect data, create a statewide audit, create a map, collect and analyze data, assist locals in training programs, identify areas, identify and coordinate, investigate and identify new technologies, identify opportunities, develop recommendations, review, and it goes on and on. So when it concludes, it says it'll generate a plan that will be implemented within eight or nine years. And that's a third grader who will now be a senior when this is implemented. And from my standpoint, I think from the Republican side, you know, you may not always get this kind of support from us, but I think we need to take bolder action. We don't have time to wait eight or nine years. Um, so hopefully you can work with us on that. I know you're on the budget committee um, and we can actually move this forward quicker. Um, and I'm sure you'll get a lot of our support for that. So thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could just respond. Um, Senator Seminary. Very briefly. I, I appreciate that. We tried to make this, um, we try to be very thoughtful and as as planners i think we're all planners we wouldn't be here otherwise that's what this is trying to do i would love to work with you on on speeding up this timeline but as you mentioned so much of it has to do with funding this is not an inexpensive endeavor um which is what i love about us this this office will take advantage of the, of the policy window we have with the federal government also taking this as a priority so that's what i love but let's let's work on and speed this up absolutely yeah and also i'll just follow right. up one last thing um you know, it's priorities in our budget, right? I mean, that's what we always talk about. You know, is this a priority or others? And you're on the budget committee, you see the priorities and hopefully you'll raise this as a much higher priority. I see the current office is already utilizing federal funds. I believe in Talbot County, they brought in 11 million through the federal grant. So they're starting to do this. We know more is coming in, but we really can't wait eight or nine years. That's my opinion, we can debate it, but you know, I'm willing to work with you. Hopefully we can get this moving. Let's get the experts together and, and work together with your caucus. Thank you, Mr. So, Chair. Senator Simonair, please, you're always welcome to provide some amendments uh, as the committee does a markup on it. Okay, um, thank you all. Um, let's go to Fabel with amendments. I have uh, Dakota Matthews and uh, John Horner. Um, please try to focus on your amendments. We've heard about the bill. You can. You can refer to the bill, but we want to hear how you do it differently. Um, Dakota Matthews. Uh, not hearing or seeing uh, Dakota Matthews. Let's go to John Horner, please. Mr. Horner. Sure. Good afternoon, Chairman Pinsky and members of the committee. My name is John Horner. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Easton Utilities in the town of Easton. We support Senate Bill 66 with some amendments as provided by the Rural Maryland Council and their testimony. Senator Elfrith did a wonderful job discussing the bill and the hard work which has been happening behind the scenes to make this bill happen. As the Senator stated, the Office of Rural Broadband has already achieved great results, and this bill would foster even more success for the state of Maryland's broadband issues. We support the bill's proposal to increase the scope of the existing Office of Rural Broadband to support areas within Maryland where affordability and literacy are very real problems. As an internet service provider, we see these issues in our service territory and provide lifeline service options for low income customers, as well as free internet services to those students on the free or reduced lunch program in Talbot County. However, there are still many residents in Talbot County throughout the Eastern Shore and in many areas of Maryland who do not even have access to broadband infrastructure. Without access to critical broadband infrastructure, addressing the affordability and literacy issues mentioned above cannot happen in these areas. There is language within this bill which could reduce or eliminate access to federal funding, federal grant funding for areas of Maryland where accessibility to broadband infrastructure remains the primary issue. The amendments proposed by the Rural Maryland Council were a collective effort from many of the broadband experts in the state and would address this issue 
of accessibility to broadband infrastructure. For the reasons stated above, the Town of Easton and Easton Utilities respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 66 with the amendments recommended by the Rural Maryland Council and the collective team of broadband experts that supported those amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horner. Any questions for Mr. Horner? Uh, seeing none, um, there are no opponents. That concludes the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 66. And uh, we will go to um, Senate Bill 73, Madam Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate Bill 73, uh, State Real Estate Commission Property Managers Registration. Senator Young, I think he misses us in EHE. And uh, so it's good to have you back. Senator Young, are you with us? I am with you, and of course I did. And uh, let me get the video up. There we go. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, I think I'm presenting a different bill than I originally intended because the House has passed this and they made substantial amendments to it. So I will try my best to present it uh, with what they've done to it. Okay. Um, first off, the purpose of the bill is to create a legal category under the Real Estate Commission for property managers. Right now, it's kind of a free range thing. Uh, they are not regulated by anyone. And uh, <clears throat> there are uh, real estate people that do property management for, for uh, big companies and for uh, local things. And there are people that just do it on the side for one, two, three, or 20 people. And uh, there are no standards or control for them. So the purpose of this bill was to bring them under uh, the Real Estate Commission. Uh, at the beginning of the bill, it lists all the things the bill doesn't do, who it doesn't cover. Um, so when it gets down to who it does cover, uh, with the amendments that have been proposed, uh, it basically covers uh, people that are doing property manager management that it, that's beyond one property or beyond the properties they personally own, but are managing for other people and are doing uh, multiple properties. Also on uh, larger uh, properties, they have written it so that um, someone, op a company op operating as a property manager who may do multiple apartment buildings or multiple buildings that are owned uh, by the developer, they only have to get one license that covers all those properties rather than multiple people having the license. So it's basically uh, not exempting large properties, but letting them do it themselves with one registered property or property manager. And for on the lower end, beyond someone managing their own properties or one property for a friend, uh, anybody doing multiple properties, properties would also have to uh, have a property management license. It uh, allows the commission to develop the guidelines beyond what are in the bill and it has uh, penalty provisions and uh, provisions for uh, bonds uh, sureties. Um, I think I've kind of covered what they were trying uh, to do with the, uh, the amendments. The fiscal note is out the window with these am amendments. It was about $550,000 a year in expense, uh, every two years in expenses and about 550,000 in uh, revenues. Under this, it's gonna take much less, or 
many less people at the Real Estate Commission to do it. And it's, there are going to be far less licenses that have to be obtained. But uh, simply, it creates a property management license under the Real Estate Commission. And it lists the ex exclusions and who requires a license. Thank you, Mr. Young. Um, take questions. Only, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Were you done? No, I say I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you, Senator. Um, so there are a number of people who have submitted written testimony um, and we just have one witness, um, Bill Castelli with his COVID beard. Uh, mm -hmm. Glad to have you here, Bill, from the Maryland Realtors. I just wanna mention the Consumer Protection Division of the Office of the Attorney General has submitted written asking for an amendment as did the Maryland Building Associate, uh, Industry Association and the uh, NIOP, the National uh, the, the Apartment and, uh, uh, and Office Buildings folks. The Department of Labor submitted written informational testimony. So with that, Kelly with the Realtors, thank you for being with us. Thank you and thanks to the committee and uh, uh, Senator Young for sponsoring the bill. Um, we're in support of the bill uh, with the amendments that the House approved. As Senator Young mentioned, the fiscal note that came in under the original bill, I think will be significantly changed by the amendments that were added in the, on the House side. And in, in short, I think what the amendments on the House side really do is try to narrow the scope of the bill to the uh, problems that were brought before the Real Estate Commission and trying to make sure that the bill is focused on the situations that the Real Estate Commission was trying to handle uh, and trying to make sure that folks who had real estate licenses who mishandled in some cases security deposits and in some cases actually mishandled the rent and, and never got the full rent payments back to the owners um, and uh, that they were not allowed to come back into the business. And what happens right now under uh, real estate law is that because real estate agents are licensed, the commission was able to take away a license from someone who actually mishandled that money, wasn't able to give them to the, or did not give the money to the owner, but that person could literally have still opened up a property management business that next day. So this bill narrows it. It's not trying to reach out to the big apartment complexes or to owners who are managing their own property. It's not trying to reach you know, subsidiary groups that um, manage very specific uh, elements of, of a property, um, not advertising. It's not trying to reach, uh, for example, somebody that a property manager would hire, a lawn care company or something like that. So it's a very narrow focus bill. It gives the ability for the commission to say, no, you know, we took away your license. You can't just open up a, a property management registration the next day, given this kind of dual, the way the law works right now, where some folks are licensed and some folks aren't. Um, and then finally, I would just say that, you know, there's about 44 states in the country right now that have some level of licensing. Um, so this is pretty, um, it doesn't go as far as most of those 44 states do. Um, but we do think this is a good first step and it allows the commission to control those situations when, uh, when a licensee has uh, violated the law. Thank you, Mr. Castelli, for your testimony and for being here. We have a question from Senator Riley. Thank you very much, Ms. Castelli. Good to see you again. Uh, will this also cover condominium association management? No. So we exempt no. out the um, condos, HOA management, and it does exempt out um, business districts as well. So there are some quasi-governmental business dis districts um, where management activities are taking place and, and those are exempted out of the bill as well, or at least out of the House amendments. It, it also exempts industrial and commercial properties. It's, it's totally- I wanna go back to the condo and the HOA. Was there a rationale why you left them off the table? Uh, there's another bill moving through the House that came out of a different committee that is very focused. It's a little, uh, I would say it's a much more robust bill on HOA and condo managers. Um, this is just a registration requirement. The bill that's moving out of uh, the House Environmental Matters Committee is a, basically a full-on licensing bill. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Costelli. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. 
Thank you, Senator Riley. Senator Carosa. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And uh, Bill, I wanted to follow up along the lines of just trying to understand, you mentioned that there were some challenges um, with property managers before the Real Estate Commission. And I was trying to better understand, um, especially in my area where we have strong and maybe not as strong property management companies. So I, I just wanna understand what you testified. You said some are already licensed, some aren't. This would require all of them to be licensed. And what, what um, issue are we, what are we trying to resolve? Because as I said, I. I, I don't want to get into examples, but you know, you know, with, with, with naming certain um, property managers. But could you tell us what we're trying to, what we would be improving with this? Sure. Right apply to my home district. Yeah. Um, so what what we're really trying to, because the bill has been pretty significantly narrowed, it, it's really serving as kind of a backstop to the commission right now. And I'll give you the the example where. There was a licensee who was managing property um, found to be in violation because they were not returning the rent payments to the actual owner of the property. So had his license actually taken away. That, that property manager literally could have opened up a business the next day doing exactly the same thing because he didn't technically need a real estate license to do that management work. So what this does is give the real estate commission kind of a backstop. So we've taken away your license because you've, um, you, you know, misappropriated funds. Um, now you're going to have to come back to us if you're going to open up your own company again and manage, you know, largely what is single family properties um, and apply to us for a registration. The bill would allow the commission at that point to turn them down for a registration which means that their only option under the law would be hooking up with an existing business where hopefully there's better oversight, they're not the owner of the property and they're working within um, a, a company that is compliant and, and aware of the law. Um, and so then the other companies that you have out there and you've got many you know, multi-unit buildings down um, in your district as well as a lot of single family properties, so a lot of the multi-unit buildings are actually exempt on the way the bill has been drafted. Um, those are folks that um, have had, they haven't never been required to be licensed. This bill wouldn't require them to be registered. And I think the, th the thought there is that, you know, they've, they've got attorneys, professional management, full-time employees doing this day in and day out. Um, and so that's the theory behind why those folks aren't covered by the bill. Thank you, Senator Carosa. Uh, Senator Simon Air. Yes, thank you. It's good to see you, Bill. Uh, in these pandemic times, uh, I would normally have seen you once or twice in the halls and uh, I see you're sporting quite a, a new beard there. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, so just to, so I understand, are you saying that Maryland Realtors support this with the amendments coming over from the house? Yes. Okay, I see no other hands raised. Colleagues, is there anything else? Other than any questions about Mr. Castelli's beard? <laughs> that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 73. Thank you, Senator Young. The next bill is Senate Bill 77, Senator Griffith. That is the energy efficient net zero homes contract preferences. Welcome, Senator Griffith. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I apologize. I'm jointly assigned to a bill in finance that has a big fiscal note. So I've been trying to juggle both. So thank you for your patience. Um, it's my pleasure. I'm Melanie Griffith. I am delighted to be here to present uh, Senate Bill 77, uh, which is ener uh, energy efficiency net zero homes. Um, just to give you a little background, the bill was introduced last session in the House of Delegates. It actually passed the House and uh, came over to the Senate, but we did not have time due to our early adjournment to address the issues that the bill seeks to bring to our attention. Um, like many of you, I have phenomenal interns this session and they haven't been able to engage as much as they would like in this legislative process. And so I've invited them to participate in the hearings today. So you have uh, Mega Savalia who's on camera and who's 
equipped and prepared to present the bill. So if I could, Madam Vice Chair and members of the Distinguished EHE Committee, I'd like to turn the bill over to Mega to present. Ms. Savalia, welcome to Education, Health and Environmental Affairs. We're delighted to have you here and you are working for one of the best and brightest senators. So you're very lucky. Feel free to unmute and begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the Senate Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. My name is Mega Savalia, and I'm a student at the University of Maryland pursuing degrees in public policy and public health. Today, I am pleased to present Senate Bill 77, which will require the Department of Housing and Community Development to give further preference to loan applications for projects that will use the services of small minority women-owned and veteran-owned businesses in the clean energy industry. These loans are specifically for net zero homes, which are homes that produce as much energy as they use. The funding comes from the Energy Efficient Homes Construction Fund, and it additionally favors businesses that provide employment for those trained through workforce development programs supported by the Strategic Energy Investment Fund and the Clean Energy Workforce Account. This bill has the ability to have meaningful effects in our community. Um, energy efficiency is the way of the future and every opportunity we have to move towards this goal should be taken. This bill is a small step, but it has a potentially great impact, not only on the environment, but also on wealth and equity opportunities in the state of Maryland through its support of the Minority Business Enterprise Program goals. Thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 77, and I respectfully request a favorable report. All right, great job, Ms. Savalia. Um, before uh, I wait for my colleagues to see if we've got some really tough questions for you, uh, I just wanna say, first off, your, your Senator was bragging about you to me this morning, so I already knew you were gonna be great. Uh, second, I just want to say, I think my colleagues have heard me talk about how proud I am to represent NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is in the heart of Gaithersburg. And there is, Ms. Savalli, I'm sure you have found it or can find it online. There is a net zero house at NIST on the campus that is awesomely cool. And I've been able to tour it. And they literally uh, assume that there are gonna be four people who take a shower in the morning and then they're gonna uh, make toast. And so they turn on the toaster and then they, uh, they turn on lights and turn off lights and they, and they figure out how, how much energy is used and how to do offsets. It's very cool. So I just mentioned that while I see if my colleagues uh, come up with zingers for you. I see no hands raised. Can we get anyone? Senator Washington, do you have a question? You're good, okay. Uh, Mega, I think we're letting you off easy today. And Madam Chair, if I could just thank Mega, great job and say thank you to uh, Delegate Rogers for bringing this to our attention. I hadn't heard of Net Zero Homes before he shared the bill with me, so. Great, well, I encourage you to, uh, Mega, to, to take a look at NIST and, and watch a demonstration video. It's very, it's very impressive. So thank you, Senator Griffith. Thank you, Ms. Savalia. And that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 77. Thank you for your work. Colleagues, the next bill is Senate Bill 85, Senator Rosapep. The bill is a creating a Governor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Senator Rosapep, welcome back to EHA. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. And uh, the members of this committee, both when I was there and since I've left, have been involved in many issues regarding immigrants. And so you're very familiar with a variety of the issues. Um, the purpose of this bill, um, is to have one place in state government, a high level, uh, where a few people reporting to the governor have to get up every morning and pay attention to the issues and opportunities regarding immigrants in our state. Now, all of us have uh, immigrants uh, in our district, um, and many, many people, even if, if they aren't immigrants, are the children of immigrants or the grandchildren of immigrants. And the immigrant experience is different from the non immigrant experience because somebody, uh, stood up, crossed an ocean, crossed a river, crossed a border, uh, took a plane, whatever it may be, uh, and came to another country. And the result is that they bring with them um, a lot of assets that um, are helpful to this country, where, whether it be education, whether it be work ethic, whether it be language skills, you can get down the list. Uh, but they also have challenges. 
And we deal with these, I mean, when I was first elected to the legislature back in the, in the 80s was when we first started uh, state funding for English as a second language from the state level. That was like a new thing. Um, the fact of the matter is that the issues and opportunities involving immigrants in the state cut across agencies. And right now we have education programs and we have uh, programs in the Department of Housing and we have all across state government, but there isn't an integrated strategic approach to it. Uh, and so that's what all this bill does, is it says we should have a high level cross-cutting reporting to the governor office, small office, uh, but that really pays attention to our immigrant population, helping them to succeed and helping them to help all of us succeed together. That's what the bill does. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Rosa Pep. You do have uh, three favorable witnesses. We do have some unfavorable as well. Let's take the favorable witnesses, then we can take questions for them, and then we'll shift to the unfavorable. Thank so, you. Um, favorable, uh, Matthew Dolomar from Catholic Charities of Baltimore, the Esperanza Center. Mr. Dolomar, welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Matthew Dolomar, and I'm here representing Catholic Charities as the director of the Esperanza Center. Esperanza provides comprehensive immigration services in the Baltimore region. It includes humanitarian legal services, English language instruction, case management, and free primary medical and dental care to the uninsured. I'm here today in support of Senate Bill 85. This bill and the presented Governor's Office of Immigrant Affairs very closely mirrors the existing Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs in Baltimore City, which is known by the acronym of MEMA. Uh, MEMA provides critical support and voice to the city's growing immigrant community, ensures language access and process equity across city departments and programs, resource access, and full community consultation. The same support is not currently available at the state level. The current COVID-19 pandemic environment provides examples of the need for this state office. And one specific example, when the state COVID-19 vaccination registration page was launched, it was translated into Spanish, but used a computer generated system. There was not a trained human translator behind that service. And as a result, critical vocabulary errors include such things as the word race being translated as carrera, which in Spanish indicates a race that you might run. The word address, was translated as habla a, as if you might address somebody that you are speaking to, not your actual home of residence. These avoidable and basic language errors will serve only to confuse and restrict access to a life-saving vaccine at a critical time in Maryland's public health. In absence of a governor's office of immigrant affairs, there is no single point of contact at the state level to ensure that issues of this nature are appropriately anticipated and addressed. The immigrant community contributes so much to the state and to our local communities. And the Governor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is one step towards integrating support across state functions for this critical and valued community of Maryland residents. And thank you for considering our views. I urge a favorable vote on SB 85. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolomar. The next witness um, is Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa. Um, Sir Inahosa, welcome. You have up to two and a half minutes. Is Mr. Inahosa there? Let's go on to the third witness and see if Mr. Inahosa comes up or comes back. Maybe Lamoria, you can look for him or something. Uh, Onyinye Alhiri, I hope I'm close. Welcome to EHE. If you can unmute and share your testimony, you get up to two and a half. Thank you, Vice Chair Kagan. Uh, you did pronounce my name correctly. Excellent. I appreciate it. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, so I'm here to address um, everyone in this committee. And thank you for hearing me today. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of SB 85, which would establish a governor's office of immigrant affairs, similar, like Matt said, to the office we have here in Baltimore City. Um, I live here in Baltimore in the 40th legislative district. Um, and this bill is incredibly important to me for personal and professional reasons. Uh, my family migrated to the US in 1997 and we actually landed right here in Maryland in Wheaton, 
um, where we found ourselves among many other immigrant families and recent arrivals from all over the world. Um, we were received well um, by the community and through the support of that community, kind Americans who had been here for generations and other social services, we were able to quote unquote make it. And so now I find myself as a graduate student working with the Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Service as an intern. Um, and this organization provides a plethora of services, including transitional and long-term foster care and family reunification to children in the US who are um, migrants, regardless of their documented status. Um, as Matt mentioned, uh, they're just, there are very specific needs that migrants have coming to the US. Language is one of them and services that are language proficient are incredibly important. There are other services as well that are specifically important to migrant populations because many do not have access to Medicaid, SSI, SNAP, or other benefits that citizens can take for granted, um, which causes them to face, causes us to face significant barriers to access. Creating this office, Establishing this office would create a network of trusted community-based centers that provide migrant services while reducing interaction and collaboration with persecutive agencies like ICE. And the services offered at this office could increase access to language programs, assist immigrants with the naturalization process, connect us to workforce development programs, and re reduce our exploitation. I support this effort because it will increase access to essential healthcare services, reduce health disparities for our communities and help us and help, help other migrants, regardless of how long they've been here or how they got here, better integrate into the United States multiple communities and have hopefully beautiful migration experiences like my family was able to have. So thank you for your time and consideration. I hope you will pass this bill favorably. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Elhiri. And I see the Alfredo Quinones in Hinojosa has joined us. We're so glad you're here. Um, you get up to two and a half minutes. You have unmuted. Please share your testimony. Welcome to EHA. Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to join. I just uh, wanted to tell you that I am extraordinarily honored to be invited to say something about me. I am an immigrant myself. Came from Mexico when I was 19 years old. I've been blessed to get amazing education in the United States, blessed by this country. And I do run an NIH-funded laboratory. Mr. Quinones in Hosa, could you just move a little closer to your microphone? Maybe, maybe it's this thing right here. Can oh, you hear me better? That's probably what it that's is. That's a million times better. Thank it's you. It's my so my dictaphone for my patients actually. So, bottom Perfect. line, I'm a, I'm an immigrant to this country. I've been blessed by tremendous education. I do run an NIH-funded laboratory right now where we find cures for cancer. I, I thank you for considering this. I think immigrants are so crucial to this country. And in science, I was looking at some of the numbers. There was an article that I was part of in Forbes magazine in which we were we understood that 42% of researchers in seven, the top seven institutions in the United States where I've been part of Hopkins, UCSF, Harvard, you know, they are immigrants. And if you look at our numbers, they are amazing and overwhelming. I think the contributions are extraordinarily important. In healthcare, you've seen it nowadays. Uh, we are at the forefront in so many different ways, not only in innovation and discoveries, but also the care that we deliver for patients. And that integration between the laboratory and patients is crucial and is really done by a lot of immigrants. So I think that I would just like to summarize by telling you that this country is a beautiful country that we have to promote innovation I think that immigration is part of uh, what we do very, very well. And I think that when we have people with different talents, different ways of thinking, it just keeps promoting an amazingly new way of changing the world. And I, I thank you immensely for allowing me to come in in between patients and say hi to all of you. Well, Mr. Quinones Inojosa, one of the reasons our country is so beautiful is because of immigrants like you. So thank you for your service and thank you for joining us today and being part of democracy. It's really important. Um, I have a question for Senator Rosapep, if he's still around. Jim. Very much around. Thank you. Um, I have two things. One is, as you know, this committee and this body passed two language access bills uh, requiring translations on state government websites. Uh, I'm Mr. Dolomore's story um, about Carrera rather than <laughs> 
rather than ethnicity uh, translated is crazy. And I wonder if you and I can look into that together or if you wanna take, take a look at that, but I, I, that needs to be addressed. So I'm totally on board, happy, happy to help. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Dolomore, you can help drive the train if you want or not, but thank you for flagging that because that is a really hot button for me and uh, something I've worked on for years. The question I have then, Senator Rosapep, or for any of your witnesses, um, I am looking at the bill and at the fiscal note. And uh, um, in the fiscal note on page three, under, under current law, it mentions, it lists the governor's office of community initiatives. Right. And it mentions that there is a governor's commission on African affairs, Asian Pacific right. American affairs, Hispanic affairs, South Asian American affairs, African American history and culture, and the commission for Indian affairs. Would you envision this superseding and no, no it, it, would this be in addition? Can you just speak to that? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. I mean, those commissions I think are terrific and I've supported all of them, but they're not just about immigration. Uh, they're about economics, they're about culture, uh, they're about uh, all kinds of people, frankly, who have those commonalities. Uh, we're talking about immigrants. We're talking about people who come to the United States from another country and uh, living their life here. Uh, and it cuts across ethnicities. Many of those are obviously ethnically related from where you come from. And this Office of Immigration Affairs is not about where you come from, but it's about where you're going. And you're in Maryland. And so uh, there, there are definitely issues that are different from people coming from different countries. I totally respect that. But, and that's what some of those commissions deal with and they should deal with them. Uh, but the commonalities I think are what this Office of Immigration Affairs would really focus on. Thank you. I have one more question, but I'm happy to defer to any colleagues who want to go first. I don't see any hands raised yet. Unless Senator Simon Air, are you indicating a desire to speak? No. Okay. Sure. Another question, Senator Simon, uh, Senator Rosenthal. Uh, yeah. We saw in the last administration, uh, pre federal administration, the Trump administration versus the Biden administration, is a significant, significant um, divergence of attitudes towards immigrants and immigration. And I'm just wondering, can you please talk about, this is all prospective, I'm not talking about a current administration, but prospectively, what would happen to this office um, if there's someone who is who has very extreme views one way or another uh, on the question of immigration or immigrants? Well, I think there's no question about it, elections have consequences. And so if Maryland elects someone who is anti-immigrant, uh, whether we have this office or not, they probably are going to push that agenda. Uh, I think setting up this office does two things. One is it makes clear the legislature's commitment uh, to work with and be embracing of immigrants. So the pol we're the policy-making body, so I think it, it puts that in policy. Um, secondly, uh, I think that by being proactive and being intentional about working with our, our immigrant communities, I think it strengthens the bonds uh, between those communities and folks who aren't immigrants. I mean, what, what, one of the reasons, at least in my experience, uh, why there sometimes is, is conflict is because um, people don't know much uh, about folks who come from other places. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in Guatemala. I've never been to Guatemala. Uh, and so, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so I think being more intentional about integrating and supporting uh, immigrants uh, in our state uh, will benefit all of us. Thank you, Senator Rosa Pep. Appreciate their answer. We have unfavorable testimony and we will first hear from Sherry Randell from FAIR. Ms. Randell, are you with us? Uh, she's, not, she's not here because she had a conflict come up. Okay, so then the next witness, uh, unfavorable, we have you, Amy yeah. Wade. Wayshoff, Wayshoff, Wayshoff. Okay, welcome to EHE. You have up to two and a half minutes. My name is Amy Wyckoff and I've lived in Montgomery County for over 33 years. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide testimony on SB 85. This legislation would set up a governor's office of immigrant affairs that would administer a costly network of neighborhood based opportunity centers to provide immigration services to illegal and legal aliens. It is clear from the language of the bill that the main focus of the advocacy provided by this office would be for illegal aliens. 
Setting up such an office would be just one more example of the Maryland legislature's attempt to make the state a magnet for more illegal aliens. The more free services provided for illegal aliens, the greater the incentive for illegal aliens to make Maryland their home. This in turn results in higher costs of living, reduced job availability, lower wages, and higher crime rates. These costs, both in terms of the economy and increased crime, would be borne by Maryland citizens. Most of the services proposed for the Governor's Office of Immigrant Affairs are not being offered to citizens of the state as a whole, so for providing them to illegal aliens is unfair. Therefore, I strongly oppose SB 85 and recommend an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Wyckoff. Thank you for being with us. Vince McAvoy is next. Mr. McAvoy, you have up to two and a half minutes. Is Mr. McAvoy with us? I do not see Mr. McAvoy. Okay. Are there questions for Ms. Wyckoff from colleagues? Senator Ellis. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And I uh, want to thank uh, Senator Roosevelt for bringing this bill. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, I thank Dr. I think Hinojosa for speaking up and talking about the benefits of immigrants. And unfortunately, um, I want to ask Ms. Weyhoff, why is her impression of immigrants uh, crime and words like illegal and, you know, there's a little disconnect with that. Um, could you address that? Well, because people on one side of the political aisle always conflate legal immigrants with illegal immigrants. So, um, and by putting bills with just the name immigrant, it, um, it obscures the fact that if you read the language of the bill, that this bill is mostly going to be helping illegal immigrants, you know, help with their DACA applications and, and what forth. And we don't need to be spending citizens taxpayers money on illegal aliens. Uh, country without rule of law and that doesn't c control um, what it does with illegal immigration um, is in a country. And uh, it's not true that um, um, immigrants in, in immigrant communities that are the victims of crime, which they're mostly the victims of crime from illegal immigrants in their own communities. There are rules in place for them to um, get special pathways to citizenship if they testify uh, and help law enforcement. Um, and it's not true that they are afraid of testifying. Um, they're only afraid if they know that the government is weak and not going to deport criminal illegal aliens. I'm talking about criminal illegal aliens in this respect. Um, okay. So thank you, Ms. Wyckoff. Um, Senator Ellis, thank you for the question. I'm not sure whether we are going to find common ground um, on these issues. Um, I, the facts and let's stay with, um, let's stay with data when we can and on the facts of the bill if we can and not group anybody all together as criminals or otherwise. Senator Simon Air, help us out here. Thank you. Uh, is Senator Rosepep still on here? Senator Rosepep, did he have to leave? Okay. We might um, have lost him. All right, well, maybe for the consideration of the, the committee that based on testimony, I think a simple solution would be on page two, line four, um, where it says is a resident of the state, we could just insert as a legal resident of the state. And I think that would take care of any uh, miscommunication, um, kind of a win-win situation. So hopefully we can do that during committee. Thank you, Senator Simon Ayer. If that's an amendment you'd like to propose, definitely mention it to legal counsel so the committee can consider it uh, when this bill comes before us. Um, thank you. Um, I see no other questions. Okay, that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 85. Thank you to Senator Rosepep, Ms. Wyckoff, and uh, Ms. Alhiri, and, uh, and Dr. Quinones Hinojosa. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Senator Griffin, you. you're back. I did not see that you had two bills or we would have put them together, um, but we're always happy to welcome you back. 
You have a business occupations and professions architect scope of licensure. Welcome. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair and uh, members of the EHE committee. I am still Melanie Griffith and I'm pleased to be here to present Senate Bill 93, which is the business occupations and professions architect scope of licensure bill. I promised phenomenal interns and I've got another one for you, but I want to share with you that this bill was introduced um, last session by Delegate Nicole Williams, who brought this issue to my attention. Initially, as she introduced the bill, there was some concerns about the bill and like a good talented legislator, she worked with the um, folks that had opposition to the bill as she proposed it last session. And the bill is presented now with the amendments that were worked out with those uh, folks in the industry last interim. And so if you would allow me, Madam Chair, I would turn it over to Madison Gibson, who is another dynamic intern in my office. All right, Madison Gibbons, uh, welcome to Education, Health and Environmental Affairs. The bar has been set high because the last bill by Senator Griffith, we had a wonderful uh, witness testifying before. So please unmute and welcome, you have up to five minutes. Yes, Mega is amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you can get closer to your microphone so we can all really hear you, that would be helpful. Is this better? I'm sorry about that. That's a little better. Okay. Um, okay. Good Thanks. afternoon. Uh, thank you, Senator Griffith. And thank you, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the Senate Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. I'm pleased to present Senate Bill 93, which raises the threshold of cost required for repairs for which a person is required to employ a licensed architect. This bill comes as a result of community businesses and homeowners who tend to struggle with simple altercations and remodeling due to the existing financial threshold under current law. The current language, although certainly necessary for larger structural repairs, simultaneously prevents many um, from making necessary changes to a structure because of the affordability of hiring an architect. So this version will allow much more room for individuals to make those repairs without having the extra expense of hiring an architect. So SB 3rd SB 93 will increase the maximum estimated cost in labor and materials from the current $5,000 to $25,000 for the alteration, which is required to employ the licensed architect. And secondly, it alters the specific circumstances under which that person is not required to employ the architect. Um, this bill does not carry any financial burden to the state or local governments, but has potentially meaningful effects on Maryland businesses and homeowners. In today's time, businesses want to offer the best experience to their customers, whether that's through design or technology. So Senate Bill 93 will allow more Marylanders to make investments into their businesses and properties and help them thrive. Thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 93, and I respectfully request a favorable report. Great job, Ms. Gibbons. You, you met the standard there, the intern standard. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the next witness is Daniel Barry, uh, Bailey sorry, from AIA, the American Institute of Architects. Welcome to EHE, Mr. Bailey. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair Kagan and committee members. Uh, my name is Dan Bailey, past president and current director of AIA Maryland, which represents nearly 2,000 architects statewide. Uh, first, I would like to thank Senator Griffith and Ms. Gibbons uh, for graciously taking the time to speak with me and Joe Metashevsky uh, prior to the General Assembly session in order to better understand the impact this bill may have on the citizens of Maryland and the built environment. AI Maryland asks for your support of this bill, which modifies regulations that define the scope and circumstances by which a licensed architect must be employed. AIA Maryland had some initial concerns with when the bill was initially introduced last year, as uh, Senator Griffith had mentioned a few moments ago. We felt that the safety, health, and welfare of Maryland citizens would be compromised and that compliance with current Maryland codes and regulations, especially the Maryland Rehabilitation Code, the Building and Life Safety Codes, and the Accessibility Codes, would be compromised or simply not be met. However, we work closely with Senator Griffith's colleague, De Delegate Williams, with DLLR 
and with the bill's constituents to negotiate revisions now successfully reflected in SB 93. The bill appropriately sets project construction cost limits that are adjusted in accordance with current accepted escalation factors. Furthermore, the bill sets clear project scoping parameters. Most importantly, SB 93 defines conditions by which the designated code official or authority having jurisdiction may require such renovations, alterations, or repairs to be documented and sealed by a licensed architect. SB 93 defines reasonable criteria for the engagement of an architect and duly protects the citizens of Maryland. Hence, AIA Maryland respectfully asks for the committee to vote in favor of SB 93. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Are there questions for Senator Griffith, Ms. Gibbons, or Mr. Bailey from my colleagues? Seeing none, that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 93. Ms. Gibbons, you did a good job selling this one here. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Um, colleagues, I just got notification uh, that Mr. McAvoy from the last bill on Senator Rosa Pep's uh, Office of Immigrant Affairs has arrived. Now, I have already said that the bill hearing was complete, but I also try to be as fair as possible. Give me a quick thumbs up, thumbs down, since uh, I don't see the chairman's face. Do, do we want to go back and give him up to two and a half minutes, or since it's done, is it done? Okay. All right. I see my colleagues with thumbs up. Mr. McAvoy, you have up to two and a half minutes. Senator Skinner, I'm sorry, I'm just going to put you on hold just for another okay. quick bit. So we are going back to Senate Bill 85 for one more opponent. Mr. McAvoy, if you could center your camera so we can see you. I'm in a bit of a corner. Can you hear me okay? Um, if you're able to rotate a little. Okay, we just want to see your face a little. Okay, do the best you can. But the most important thing is that we hear you. So right. welcome to EHE. We're going to give you just as a courtesy because um, we did already complete the witness hearing, but uh, you are unfavorable in Senate Bill 85. Please begin. Correct. And Senator, thank you so much for the courtesy and, and committee, thank you so much. Um, I did have written testimony and I appreciate this courtesy. And um, you know what I found interesting, um, Senator Kagan, I recently sent you an email about what you'll see on page two of my written testimony having to do with the dire state that we are in this, in this at this time right now. We have one of the richest states, and in your county, we have people in food lines right now, and it's a horrible thing. And it's not to say that we don't have loving people in Maryland, we do, but a matter of drawing priorities. And I did hear the tail end, uh, forgive me, I was in JPR, but um, I did hear the tail end where uh, Senator Simon here offered an amendment, I think, from a legal standpoint, that's a great thing. I think from a where the rubber hits the road issue, I still think that we're missing the mark, still remain unfavorable on this bill. We, we are in dire times and, and I don't know what it would take for us to understand that that we we as Marylanders and, and honestly you as legislators and Senator, again, I sent you an email and, and, and thanks because you have been storming the palace, so to speak with unemployment benefits not being made, our Marylanders are in horrible shape. And I just urge you all to vote this down and to really spend the rest of the time that you're in Annapolis this session helping out Marylanders who are going through unprecedented, never in the history of the state type of unbelievable financial calamity, social calamity. We've got to get our children um, normalized back again. And uh, I thank you so much committee for your time doing urgent and unfaithful and, and your courtesy is greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. McAvoy, for your testimony. We do know how busy it is uh, going back and forth between committees. So glad you made it here from JPR, survived the journey. Yes, so grateful, thank you. <laughs> now that really, really completes the hearing on Senate yes. Bill 5, the next bill, and I believe the last bill of the day is Senate Bill 117 with Senator Sidner. Welcome back to EHA, Senator Sidner. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, for the record, Senator Charles Sidnor, I testifying in support of uh, Senate Bill uh, 117. Uh, I, I wanted to say this past summer, uh, I had just finished reading a book by uh, 
Andre Perry, uh, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's uh, Black Cities, and uh, had had a discussion uh, with uh, Delegate Brooke Learman, who's uh, the cross file uh, for this legislation and, and actually uh, brought the idea uh, to me about uh, introducing this legislation uh, with her. Uh, so back in 2014, uh, this body uh, tasked uh, DHCD to do a similar report uh, looking at uh, home ownership and neighborhood revitalization and, and the like, uh, but there were not any uh, specific strategies uh, that talked about uh, uh, how you extended this uh, to uh, with home ownership uh, for, for minorities. So she asked me if I would cross file, uh, given some of the things that I was reading. I mean, there were uh, articles that looked at uh, property assessments and, and the discriminatory effect in property assessments. Uh, you, you had uh, a book by Richard Rothstein of the color of law, which which kind of chronicles uh, housing discrimination that's been baked into uh, the fabric, not only in, in state law, but in federal law uh, back in the 1930s um, with things like the GI Bill and, uh, and, and just how redlining really devastated the ability uh, for black communities uh, to build wealth because uh, of their being excluded uh, from this very important uh, government program that built the middle class here in the United States. So to the bill, what the bill does is it looks to build off of what you all did back in uh, 2014 before I arrived in the General Assembly and it creates a, a work group uh, at this point, I believe the work group is, is has about 16 members, but I, I'll tell you, uh, there have been a number of emails uh, that have been uh, going back and forth with a number of organizations and people who have looked uh, to be a part of this work group because of the importance um, of what the work group is doing, which is looking at about 10 different uh, uh, things uh, to uh, examine or make an assessment of where we are with with housing uh, and, and home ownership and barriers and the like. Um, and and so with that, uh, that that's kind of that's an overview of the bill. Um, what I would like to do is is hand this over to uh, my my panel, uh, which which with our lead. Uh, proponent uh, Claudia Wilson Randall from the uh, Community Development Network for Maryland. Uh, if after her, I'd like to have uh, Marceline White from Maryland Consumer Network. And I believe, and I don't see him in-, in Antoine the, Thompson is the third name that I Yes, have. and I don't see him in here, but he's with- All right. uh, Well, so. let's see if Mr. Thompson arrives by the time it's his turn. Sometimes- people Thank you very much. Again. So thank you, Senator Sidner. Uh, Claudia Wilson Randall, welcome to EHE. You have up to five minutes. Great. Um, I'm going to try to take less than five minutes. Um, I just want to thank you all, um, members of the Education, Health, and Environmental Committee, uh, for having me here today. You have my written testimony, uh, but there are just a few points that I want to highlight. Uh, Senator Sidner started out with uh, a, a little bit of a bibliography, and I just want to say at this moment in history, there are no fewer than 20 books on housing discrimination uh, in the, the U.S., how, it's take, the, how it took place legally, um, and how it persisted, and then how it actually shows up in our world today. So if you need a bibliography, we can go through that. Uh, the Color of Law, Richard Rothstein, Race for Profit uh, by uh, uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor, The Black Butterfly uh, by Lawrence Brown that just came out this month, The Road to Zero Wealth, uh, and, and, and a number of other books, Andre Perry's book as well. So um, there's, there's just so much at this moment in history uh, where we are on this topic. 
And so one of the things that I hope that this work group really addresses is just the overall, not just studying the disparity, but actually ways that we can close the disparity. I think we have a unique opportunity in the state of Maryland to actually to begin closing disparities. We are among the five wealthiest states in the country. We have a, a robust intellectual group and we have uh, the openness uh, now in the legislature at, at, at every level to, to actually begin closing disparities. So I just want us to say that um, I am the executive director of the Community Development Network of Maryland. We are a statewide network advocacy and promotion network for community development organizations across the state. Part of our network is also the Maryland Housing Counselors Network. Housing counselors are part are an important part of our network, and they help people directly. Uh, and, and housing counseling to some degree is a HUD designation, but they help people directly with buying and preventing foreclosure as well as financial counseling. And so this help is actually a really important component to this conversation. And I hope as you think about this work group, you also engage this group because they have the experience of working with uh, a variety of communities black and brown, low income people in helping them on the way to home ownership and on the way to improving their overall financial well-being. So the engagement, my engagement with this group over the last 10 to 15 years has really connected me with a strong also neighborhood and community-based framework um, to this issue. Um, we need to think about how we build strong communities and how we at attack housing discrimination and systemic poverty. There is no more basic need than a home. All of our opportunity starts from where we live. It starts at a home. So we just, you need to take, as you consider policy, that's where it starts. That's where also all of the discrimination starts. Um, so I just want to be really clear that we are addressing that. We also need to create an economy that works for all people post recovery. This is critical to a recovery for all people across the state of Maryland. Ms. Randall, we need you to wrap up. Here. Okay, absolutely. I just want to say that the barriers to home ownership for low income and minority people have been from imagination the legacy of homeownership, banks and lenders, real estate discrimination, appraisal discrimination, you, as Ms. well Randall. as predator predatory practices. So okay. I hope that this work group will address all of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Randall. We really appreciate it. We're trying to, uh, to keep things going today and every day, actually. Um, colleagues, I indicated that I thought that this was our last bill. It was the last bill in my pile. Uh, it was not the last bill for the day, and I just had more added to the pile. So sorry to get your hopes up. We have more work to do. Uh, with that, Marceline White, welcome to EHE. Thank you for being here. And uh, colleagues, uh, those with your hands up, let's wait until after the proponents are completed. Um, Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Good yep. afternoon, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the committee. My name is Marceline White. I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition, MCRC. And MCRC advances economic rights and financial inclusion through research, education, advocacy, and direct service. We're here today in strong support of SB 117, and I want to thank Senator Sidner for bringing the legislation forward. Um, he mentioned what the bill does and why the what the work group will look at. I just want to take a few minutes um, to mention why it's needed. Um, I live in Baltimore City, and as many of you know, Baltimore City was really ground zero for redlining. And I can tell you that today the legacy of those red lines still exist throughout our city. And you see that time and time again in terms of bank access, food access, um, um, health issues. Um, so these legacies of these policies have real impact today. But specifically in Maryland, white home ownership rate is 25% percentage points higher than the rate for black families. In Maryland, white home ownership rate is 76.8%, while black home ownership rate is 51.8%. Now, home ownership 
is an important way to build wealth and assets, to build equity. Many people use their home equity to borrow against and finance college and other things that their families need. It's an important source of intergenerational, we intergenerational wealth. And it's an important source for small businesses. Many small businesses get their start in um, people's kitchens, in people's garages. Um, and so it also is an incubator in that way. But in Maryland, again, we have an appraisal gap. Um, a study shows that a home in a majority black neighborhood is valued on average at $48,000 less than an identical home in a majority white neighborhood. We're eager to be part of this work group because of our work on the Community Reinvestment Act, which looks at how banks um, finance and invest in communities in their footprint. And CRA was established to end redlining. So loan denials and looking at where banks are and aren't lending is an important part of that. And we still see in Maryland today that there is a gap in terms of who is approved for loans and who is denied for loans. Um, in Baltimore City, 14.6% of loan applications from white borrowers were denied, while 30.33% of mortgage loan applications from black borrowers were denied. And this number is about the same, the statistics are different, but the percentage difference is about the same in, Prince, in Montgomery County. Um, we also know that there's been predatory lending in the past. The uh, 2008 recession showed that certain um, individuals and black communities were targeted with predatory products. And in fact, there were many settlements around fair housing and predatory products. We think experts with that expert with that lens are important to this as well. Ms. This White, is a- if you, could, if you could start to wrap up, please. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we just think that this is an important work group to meet this moment in history and to move forward with addressing the disparities in home ownership and helping to build assets in majority black communities. So we ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, the next witness, Antoine Thompson from NAREB Narab. Has Antoine Thompson joined us? I do not see Mr. Thompson. Let's he was yeah, he was here earlier, but I don't see him anymore. Well, let's take one more witness, uh, and then if he arrives in time, then we will uh, pop him back in. Daryl Carrington. Mr. Carrington, are you here? Okay, so, uh, so colleagues, there is one uh, unfavorable person who signed up, but it was not for written or oral. So I'm not sure that we can understand the reasoning for signing up against it, but uh, check out the other testimony from the Catholic Conference, Strong Future Maryland, Montgomery Women's Democratic Club, the Rural Health Association, Commission on Civil Rights, Realtors had a suggested amendment and the uh, Baltimore County Executive. So you can check out those. And uh, with neither Mr. Carrington nor Mr. Thompson here, that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 117. Thank you, yeah. Senator Sidner. There, there are a couple of questions, I think. I apologize. Yes, there are. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ellis, followed by Senator Carosa. Senator Ellis, please begin. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and Senator Sidner, for this bill. You know, I'm quite aware of a lot of the issues tied into uh, housing discrimination, being a veteran. Um, uh, hopefully, being a veteran and being part of the, one of the uh, first and longest uh, serving uh, uh, American Legion posts uh, as uh, prin principally African-American in the state, the issues we deal with and we see after effects continually uh, to this day. Um, I, I, for all the work you reference, uh, forgive me if you said this one, but there is a book out, my wife introduced me to this book. It's called Not In My Neighborhood how bigotry shaped a great American city. It's a book about uh, Baltimore. It focused on Baltimore, so really close to home. A lot of the issues that this bill addressed is chronicled in that book, I'm sure others that you have said. Um, so uh, I would look forward to, uh, you know, um, this going through and supported it. And uh, that's all. Um, Isn't that so, Senator Ellis? Is that so? Thank Excellent. You. Thank you, Senator. Senator Excellent Perosa. book. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I'll be brief. Is Senator Sidnor the sponsor still on? I am. 
Yes. Oh, good. Well, thank you for um, introducing the bill. And since you in your opening testimony, I think there was a little bit of an invitation there. I uh, wanted to see if you would uh, entertain having the uh, Rural Maryland Council added to the work group. I noticed when I was going through the um, members, there was the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. And um, I certainly know that this is of interest um, in my district and um, I have been in touch with the director of the Rural Maryland Council and they would like to be added to it. Oh, I, I would have no objection at all. It, it's funny, I think uh, when I was looking at the testimony, um, many organizations and others, they're, they're looking to be a part and I, I think it's wonderful. Um, and, and this is something that's happening throughout the state. So I would welcome uh, them and, and uh, to, to the bill. And, and I thank you. That. Thank you, Senator Carroza. Thank you, Senator Sidner. One last call for Antoine Thompson or Daryl Carrington or any questions? They're not there. They're not there. Okay. So that now completes the hearing on Senate Bill 17. And now, Senator Sidner, you truly are free to go. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, Senator McRae, Senate Bill 365, Neighborhood Business Development Program, Food Desert Projects, Business Retention. Welcome, Senator McRae. Good to have you back. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all members of the respective committee. Um, I come to you with a phenomenal panel. Um, uh, Colin Tauber from the Baltimore Development Corporation, Holly Frischstadt from Department of Planning, um, and Marshall Klein, I believe, uh, one of our supermarket uh, owners. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but we, in, in a number of our neighborhoods, we've had uh, our local supermarkets, not just, uh, we've been trying to get them, but we're also having a hard time retaining some. Mm -hmm. One of the things is, is that I just had one close in my respective neighborhood several months ago, uh, a shot right in, um, I said shot right, save a lot over in uh, Oliver. Um, and the reality is, is that once we lose these supermarkets, sometimes it takes decades to replace them and get them back um, in that space. Mm -hmm. So while I, I, you know, the last six or seven years, I've been ignorant. I've been trying to focus my uh, opportunities on um, trying to get supermarkets. I haven't been thinking about those partners that we traditionally already have in the neighborhoods that are already on the brink of possibly moving out uh, because of one or two other reasons. I then connected with, uh, our local development company, uh, which is, uh, uh, or I should say local development organization, but the economic development organization in Baltimore City and say, hey, what are some of the toolbox tools or in the toolboxes that we can help from a retention standpoint um, for our respective uh, uh, food markets, especially in these challenging areas. And um, they gave us a list of different ideas. And I think that we brought forth one that was very measured and reasonable. Uh, we already have a program at the Department of Housing and Community Development that exists around capital infrastructure. So when you're trying to do refrigeration and things of that nature, you can get grants or you can get low, low percentage loans. One of the things that we were thinking about was from an operating standpoint, some of these businesses that we're talking about, when you're talking about workforce, when you're talking about that grocer, they're more than likely hiring people out of that respective community. So some of it is just the turnover that they may have and the workforce training piece of it. Some of it is the security uh, uh, piece of it, a number of operating opportunities, not just capital opportunities. So we look to expand a program that exists already specifically around healthy food opportunities. And we look to also uh, focus that on the operating piece, not just the capital piece. And that is Senate Bill 365 uh, uh, in a nutshell. Um, bringing it, bringing up the dollar amount from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand, and expanding it for operating standpoint. Um, if I can, Madam Chair, uh, I know we put down the lead as Marshall Klein, but Colin yeah. Harbor is the true person leading this effort, and I, I wanted to make sure that I recognize that. Okay, that. so then I will switch that. Um, so, Mr. Talbert, uh, Tarbert, welcome. Thank you, Senator McRae. Mr. Yes, Tarbert, sir. welcome to Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs. You have up to five minutes. Uh, great, thank you very much, um, Madam Vice Chair and uh, members of the committee, and thank you to uh, Senator McCray for having me. I, I will try to yield some of my five minutes uh, to keep you on schedule um, and defer to my additional panelists uh, here today. So uh, we, I am Colin Tarbert. I'm the president and CEO of the Baltimore Development Corporation. Uh, as indicated, we are the city's economic development agency, and we work very closely with our city department of planning, which is represented today as well. Uh, and have been working on food access and 
healthy food access from an economic development standpoint, which includes, um, as indicated today, what we're here to talk about is, is the retention of uh, grocery stores, which uh, are not only an economic engine in terms of uh, jobs in the community, uh, but also uh, a real community development tool uh, to create you know, livable places for people. And uh, unfortunately, as the Senator indicated, uh, we had a save a lot close in a high food priority area this year during the pandemic. And, and sadly, I, last week, I'm not sure if it's public yet, but we will another uh, grocery store is closing. Um, Holly's nodding, nodding her head, which is the DMG. This is a Salvation Food nonprofit operation uh, that BDC, our agency, worked very hard uh, with others to bring into Baltimore. So that was a, a second blow and sort of a reality of uh, what it takes to uh, operate a grocery store, especially in an urban location. Uh, um, you know, if the Salvation Army can't do it, uh, you know, I'm not sure who can. And so, um, you know, we're here today in full support of Senate Bill 0365 uh, to help us with a new tool uh, or an expanded tool, should I say, to keep our grocery stores operating um, in Baltimore City and to make sure that there is healthy food access available. It's very challenging to um, attract a grocery store. We've had lots of conversations about that. Uh, and so really retention is sort of the most important tool for us. Let's not lose what we already have um, while we work on other unique, innovative ways to, uh, you know, provide food access. We've worked with Lyft, we've worked with grocers, we've worked with the public markets. Uh, but this bill that is before you today is really kind of key to just keeping us um, whole in terms of what we do have. So I'm happy to answer any questions for the committee and uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Tarbert for being with us today. And thank you for the work that you do to help uh, Baltimore get strong and stay strong. Uh, next up, uh, Holly Freistadt from the Baltimore City Department of Planning. Welcome, Ms. Freistadt. You have up to two and a half minutes. Great, good afternoon and thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Holly Freistadt, Food Policy Director for Baltimore City and also the Division Chief for Food Policy and Planning. I'm here to support Senate Bill 365. The Food Policy and Planning Division, we oversee the food environment mapping that includes food deserts and in Baltimore City on that term is healthy food priority areas. I just wanna give you some key stats and these are from 2018 from our city food environment brief. Approximately 24% of Baltimore city residents are in healthy food priority areas. That's around 146,000 people. Uh, children and older adults are disproportionately impacted. Uh, taking racial equity into account, 31% of black residents live in healthy food priority areas compared to only 9% of white residents. In light of COVID-19, the food retail environment and food insecurity has drastically changed. It's important to understand that food insecurity has escalated as a result of the pandemic. The number of residents impacted is greater than it was in 2018. And the food retailer landscape has also been greatly impacted. In order to address these barriers on food access, the city has a healthy food um, environment strategy, really looking at creating a thriving, equitable and resilient food environment um, that addresses the diversity of food retail from supermarkets to corner stores, convenience stores, public markets, um, and also other innovative micro enterprises that provide healthy food access points. As uh, Colin already mentioned, we partner very closely with the Baltimore Development Corporation and many other agencies. Uh, this bill provides a program that supports various types and sizes of food businesses uh, for retention purposes. It provides forgivable loans that are essential to building a resilient, healthy food retail environment, especially in our healthy food priority areas. Expanding the neighborhood business development program through this bill will create more robust opportunities to support existing retailers and direct new enterprises to the areas that need them most. The fiscal impacts of retaining food retailers will surpass the investment needed to make these forgivable loans. We respectfully request support and favorable report on Senate Bill 365. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Freshett. Your timing was perfect. I was just about to ask you to wrap up. So thank you for your testimony. Marshall Klein from Klein's ShopRite of Maryland. Mr. Klein, thank you for being with us. And I'm sorry to hear that you are closing or have closed. Tell us about that. I'm not hearing you. 
You look like you're unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. How about now? Yeah, it's perfect. Can you just get a little closer to the microphone so we can hear you really well? No problem, Senator Kagan. Thank you, uh, thank you as well, Senator McRae, uh, for having me here today to talk about food insecurity in Baltimore City. So uh, I own and operate the ShopRite of Howard Park, which is the largest supermarket within Baltimore City. Uh, we are certainly the largest supermarket that chose to reinvest in a food insecure area or a food priority area. Uh, we've been in the city for well over seven years, and I am intimately familiar with the challenges facing food retailers in uh, areas like Baltimore City. I think that the Senate bill is very appropriate to help keep the retailers that we have. I know that the BDC and certainly Colin has worked tirelessly to try to get new businesses into the city. Um, but there are very there are a lot of challenges uh, running grocery stores in general, uh, but also in, in areas that, that are food insecure. And, and the base level of those challenges in Baltimore City are the cost of operation are significantly higher than in suburban locations. And unfortunately, uh, the ability to charge for those costs um, doesn't exist. And therefore, you don't have any new businesses that really want to invest in certain challenging locations. Uh, and even if businesses do want to invest, they need a tremendous amount of public support and coordination to have a shot at being successful. I think this bill does a lot to provide added resources to retailers and different groups that have already uh, committed to these areas and committed to um, anywhere that has food insecurity and allows them to do critical upgrades, whether it's training or facilities. You know, our business is kind of the worst of all worlds. We are highly capital intensive and we are very low margin um, and we are highly competitive. So the ability to have um, grants or loans or forgivable loans to take on necessary upgrades uh, to keep markets modern, to keep markets even just workable. You know, $100,000 may sound like a lot to many people, but the truth is in a supermarket building, that equates to a couple cases and half a front end system. I mean, if you're running a small 5,000 square foot, slightly larger than a corner store, um, that a lot of these areas could benefit from there, where there are retailers in these areas, $100,000 is quite significant to be able to upgrade fresh food offerings, to be able to upgrade infrastructure. Um, and you know, most supermarkets in the city certainly employ local populations. My company, we hire ex-offenders, we are second chance, we are a first time opportunity employer. And to be able to retain businesses like ours and others, uh, I believe is very critical. And I think this, this is just one more tool in the toolbox. And while I don't believe it will be the panacea to the challenge that we face, it is certainly uh, a needed step. So I urge the committee to support this bill. I'm Thank you. to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Klein, your perspective is valuable. Uh, Robin Clark, we are happy to have you back here uh, with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Welcome back to EHA. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, Robin, Robin Jessica Clark. From closer to the microphone, please. Absolutely. Better? Robin? Go ahead. It's still not good. Um, Robin Jessica Clark with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, here, can you hear me now? No. Mm -hmm. I, I better just go because I don't want to waste time. <laughs> um, here today in support of Senate Bill 365, uh, I understand and appreciate the interest in, in the proponents of retention of the existing uh, remaining more traditional food markets uh, in food desert areas. Uh, CBF supports this initiative in part alongside the work that we do to try to connect Maryland farmers to Maryland market markets. Um, but in um, even in the larger perspective are you know highly supportive of addressing the needs of local food deserts uh, to improve the health of Maryland residents and also um, to help support the environment. Um, these local businesses strengthen the local economies and when they're tied in with local growers can even help preserve open spaces, green spaces within the city or um, preserve those productive lands throughout Maryland. I, I linked in the bottom of our testimony a report that features a Pennsylvania initiative called the Fresh Food Financing Initiative and I just would like to draw out that that very successful program over the course of six years supported 58 stores in underserved areas and 3,500 jobs. 
And that program was providing a $250,000 grant and a $2.5 million loan program. So I do appreciate what the sponsor is trying to do here. And I think the way that he set it forth as sort of a modest step to try to support and address um, this issue, which I think all of us understand um, the, these health disparities as, as being even more front and center as we're facing the, the COVID-19 crisis. So for these, meeting, uh, for these reasons, um, support and urge the committee's favorable report. Thank you, Ms. Clark. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, colleagues, just for the record, um, in our files, we have testimony, favorable testimony from East Development, East Baltimore Development Inc., the Maryland Catholic, Catholic Conference, the Greater Baltimore Committee, the Maryland Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Mayor's Office of Government Relations. Listen to this. The Maryland Department of Health came in favorable. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, yes. Maryland Hospital Association, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield, Maryland Maryland Health and then information from Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. So there is a lot of support for this bill and there are some questions for you, Senator McRae or witnesses. So let's lead off with Senator Ellis. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, and thank you, um, Senator McRae for this bill, which addressed a really big problem in so many of our communities. I just say representing Charles County, um, we have this issue, food desert in some of our rural areas. So uh, I have some concerns, which I can talk to you offline. But I have a question for, uh, I think, Mr. Klein, uh, the, the uh, supermarket owner, I believe that's the name. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. what, thank you. What are the uh, cost factors that makes it more expensive to operate a supermarket in say Baltimore city in certain neighborhoods. Um, as a CPA, anecdotally, I would think that uh, rent is, is cheaper than say in a booming suburban area. I would think that uh, labor also more available in maybe a lower <laughs> price point as far as the competition for folks looking for jobs, uh, the supply is there, put it that way. So I'm not sure why, um, the cost would be so much more prohibitive to operate a grocery store in, say, one of these food deserts? Oh, I'd be happy to answer that question, Senator. Um, it's a very good question. And uh, pretty much it comes down, down to this. So while rent may be slightly less than in a suburban location, uh, there are a variety of, of expenses that happen, particularly in Baltimore City, um, that are significantly higher than a suburban location, everything from water bills, which are twice that of surrounding areas, real estate and personal property taxes, which there are programs to address through the BDC, but those numbers are around twice as much. The, the core factor is this, that when you're in an urban location, your trips are much higher, but your basket is much lower. So my urban stores have my second highest trip in my entire company, but my sixth highest sales. So from just number perspective, that's like 18,000 people in and out of the doors a week with an average basket of around $35, where in a suburban market, I might have 15,000 transactions a week with a basket of $54. And that has to do with a variety of factors from income to just the way people shop in urban centers. Um, and what that does is it adds a lot more expense on your front end because you have to process all these transactions and the amount of foot traffic in your store um, rises a lot of costs. Like there's just more people, so repair and maintenance is higher. And you're not, the most efficient transactions are big ring, low amount of people transactions, which is sort of the opposite of what you have in urban areas. Um, the other thing that, that is a challenge, and I mean, there is also security and, and shrink, but the truth is the, the main factor, the main factor is really that trip issue. Um, when we're also looking at like mix, the items that people tend to buy um, in urban areas, the mix out is not as profitable as in a suburban location. So they're much less perishable focused, um, which is something that we're trying to improve. And I know Holly's doing a lot of work with, with healthy food options. 
um, in urban areas and in trying to increase produce cutout, which is a more profitable area of the store. Dairy cutout is a more profitable area of the store. Um, they're much more focused on, it's just what people buy. Um, it's more meat and, meat and grocery, which are good too, but not, not, not nearly as good. And the, the last thing that really is, is affecting the stores is turnover. You know, that is by far my number one turnover store. We ran well over 100% turnover a year. And it's a very weird, or not, I shouldn't say weird. It's a very interesting um, dynamic for us in that we're in a neighborhood that has significantly above average unemployment. And we struggle to find applicants who stay in our company working. So that store employs roughly 200 people, anywhere between 190 and 210 people on average. Um, and the stay time for many of my associates is you know, six to nine months. And while we have no trouble getting applicants, the training and development cost of every new applicant there runs well in excess of $3,000. So that all kind of combines together to really drive up your operating costs um, in an urban location. Hope that answers you. Yeah, thank you for this masterclass in uh, supermarket management. I appreciate it. That was a great question, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Klein, for a thoughtful answer. Senator Washington. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator McRae, for bringing this bill and, and a couple of the other bills. Uh, even though uh, all the folks testify are mostly Baltimore City, uh, this is a statewide bill, correct? And it yes. has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say that, but I also just had a question and maybe it's for uh, Tarbin uh, and, or, or, or Holly Freestadt. How are you defining desert, food deserts and sort of the placement of, the, of these um, grocery stores? So for example, you know, it's, I, I don't know if it's official, you kind of let the bag, the cat out of the bag with DMG, but that's in my district. And I'm kind of actually not surprised because it's within six blocks of a giant store and seven blocks of another uh, grocery store. So I'm just kind of curious as to how you define a desert. In fact, we were very concerned. We felt like we weren't a, a food desert and perhaps a store like this should have been more over into Senator McRae's uh, area a little farther over uh, the other side or even a little farther south. Um, you know, closer to North Avenue or something like that. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, when we're looking at this program and, and standing up this program, I want to make sure that the state is truly, truly investing, you know, in true food deserts and not simply a place where somebody sets up a, a, a you know, there's already a, a market and they're just hoping to draw on away from, you know, other, other more productive markets. If I could jump in here too, because the program already exists, we're we're expanding on a program that already exists. So they have within DHCD um, yeah. with priority funding areas and sustainable communities where they uh, have it already mapped who would even be yeah. eligible and what, what specific area. Just FYI, I just want to jump in there before Holly. Oh, and definitely. And I appreciate you, uh, you know, pulling defense on that. Um, um, but this is. Uh, this is again, I think the question is still relevant uh, in how we're going to define because we're adding food deserts and I don't see a definition of food deserts in the bill. And I just want to be really clear that we truly are supporting food deserts and not just providing up op additional opportunities for people that already have opportunities. And again, this is my district and, I, and my, my constituents would support what I'm saying right now. Great, Senator, I'll address your question as far as the definition. This is Baltimore City specific definition yeah. Yeah. for healthy food priority areas. There's four key factors. There is a quarter mile from a supermarket, 185% of poverty, low vehicle availability and low healthy food availability, all right? Um, now to answer your question, DMG Foods, that is not in a healthy food priority area um, because there is a giant right around the corner. Um, so it doesn't mean that stores don't locate in other areas in Baltimore City, um, but that is the definition that we have. And then if you need to look for more information on our website, we do have a map that has all the locations. Um, and then Colin, if you want to speak very quickly to how BDC does a tax credit, which is an overlay over the healthy food priority areas for grocery store attraction and retention, that'd be great. Yeah, um, and I, I might not have all of the, the specifics, but we basically use the, the analysis that the planning department does to, um, to generate the map. And then with you fall within that, 
that area, we have um, personal property tax uh, credits for existing uh, and new grocery stores, but, but mainly existing grocery stores to reinvest in uh, their equipment. And then they receive a 10 year uh, abatement on that tax, um, the personal property tax, which is significant in Baltimore city. It's twice the, the property tax. And so we don't want to penalize people for investing uh, in their, uh, in their grocery stores. And we've seen the success of that credit, um, you know, it, it had one in East Baltimore and there, there may have been others as well. Um, but, but that's kind of goes part and parcel with the idea of having a, um, of the uh, retention of what we do have. Great. Uh, I, I won't take any more of the committee's time, but I think it would be probably helpful for us to, to sort of talk about that when we're recruiting in the placement of, of uh, grocery stores and making sure that we truly are recruiting uh, and placing them in, in, true, in true deserts. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Washington. Let me just remind folks, there was no opposition to this bill. I think a lot of us have questions though, and we are educating ourselves and the public, anyone who's watching. But if we can try to keep the questions a little briefer and the answers a little briefer, uh, we still have three bills and then a subcommittee meeting and then just lots more stuff. So Senator Patterson followed by Senator Hester followed by me. Senator Patterson. You need to unmute. Okay. Are we good? Yep. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and um, thank you, Senator McCray, for uh, bringing uh, this bill forward. Uh, this is a state issue. Uh, I have a similar problem in Prince George's County, uh, trying to ensure that we get uh, quality food stores in, in our particular areas, and the word we get most of the time as to why we can't, because most of our residents uh, work downtown, so <laughs> and they're out of the county during the day, so not much money is coming in during the day. But, um, you know, we spent quite a bit of time talking about this under the president's um, uh, um, equity and inclusion task force, uh, talked about the importance of, of healthy foods and how it's directly related to health disparities. So it is crucial and very timely situation to look at this holistically so that uh, we can do better in providing health and safety food to all the people that live in, in, in the county and in the state. Last question. Are these funds basically for operating and capital or just one? No. The grants or the funds? Yes, sir. So currently it already exists for capital. This is already initiated for capital. This will be expanding and adding it from an operating standpoint. Ah, uh, so you're just looping some more into it. I see. Okay. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. To 100,000? And moving it up from 50 to 100. Yes, sir. I talked to BDC and they was uh, saying that this will be a good recommendation, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Hester? Thank you very much, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Senator McRae, for bringing this bill. I fully support this bill. Um, I think it's a, it's a great idea and I've actually ex experienced it, not necessarily personally, but um, in other countries where I've worked. It's not just to Maryland, it's not just the U US, it expands to other countries as well. So my question is, um, you know, is the incentive great enough? In the letter from DHCD, you know, they point out that up to, if the loans are forgiven, up to 37% could be taxable uh, income uh, at the federal level. And so I wouldn't wanna see that surprise anybody that the, 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 the grocery stores weren't getting the full kind of uh, grant that they thought they were getting. And I think Robin pointed out uh, from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Ms. Clark pointed out that there was they were doing a lot more in Pennsylvania. And I looked quickly at that testimony, Ms. Clark, but I couldn't see the link to the Pennsylvania initiative you were talking about. So I think um, I'd really like to help um, make sure that there is actually enough of an incentive in this program to make it viable. 
very much appreciate you. I'll give you a short answer. I've been looking at this because it's been a longstanding issue um, in my community. Uh, O'Malley, Governor O'Malley actually really looked at this, I want to say 2013, 2012. They dug into this and they talked about the Pennsylvania Initiative. It's a lot of uh, information out there from the report and the work group that was put together on a specific issue. Unfortunately, we, we actually in the O'Malley uh, administration have recommended and put into implementation that there was money specifically cut out for food deserts. Um, that then got wrapped into, we got the new administration, that then got wrapped into Naval Works as a whole. So the food desert money that would have been specifically isolated for this issue, then got wrapped into it as a whole. So I think that the, the money was always intended to be there, and then it got put into Naval Works and made that pot a little bit uh, 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 bigger per se, um, Senator Fry Hester. And I'm looking at, so it's about a $10 million pot is what you see in uh, uh, Naval Works, which wasn't always a $10 million pot. It's because that money got siphoned over to there. So I think that it is there um, uh, per se, and we could always build on it. If, it. if you don't feel as though the 100,000 is enough, maybe it's 150. I'm not sure what the sweet spot is, but it was 50 at this moment. I talked with BDC and they recommended um, bumping it up. Uh, and I, I also tried to do it under a measured approach that I thought would get past EE. So I'm hoping <laughs> all of our colleagues, um, a unanimous matter is what I was thinking about when I thought about the, the dollar amount too. So. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Hester, Senator McCray. Uh, my question is twofold. The first one I think is going to be uh, primarily to Mr. Klein, the second one for you, Senator McCray. Um, I have heard that during COVID that uh, grocery stores, markets are doing great and making lots and lots of money because people can't go out to restaurants. And so they are shopping more cooking more at home or even buying um, quick prepared options and stuff. So I'm just curious about the impact of the coronavirus on your store or on others, what you know about. And then the second question, primarily for Senator McRae, briefly, we've talked about the job aspect, the economic development aspect, but food deserts, one of the biggest problems is healthcare, because if you can buy fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff, you can keep your family healthy and somebody referred to Ms. Freistadt and stuff, but I just wanna make sure that that is briefly a part of the conversation. If you're able to just super fast uh, reference that implication, that would be great. So if I could first ask Mr. Klein to speak to the first question. Uh, sure, uh, the answer is, I'll be very brief, yes and no. So <laughs> yes, uh, the volume in grocery stores is up significantly. Um, not like it was in the spring, but it is still up over prior year. However, um, there have been a tremendous amount of expenses involved in operating a business right now. So we have invested in my own company, hundreds of thousands of dollars in PPE equipment, plexiglass, distancing, the level of productivity that I used to have in my stores is down significantly because I have to have occupancy limits, not just within the store, um, which were large format stores, it's not a huge issue, but in production areas. So like a deli line that could have five people now can have three break rooms, you know, we have to find other areas for that, which isn't a cost, but, and we have also increased pay uh, significantly both throughout the pandemic and we've had to do bonuses to try to do uh, retention of help. So yes, we are doing better. Um, no, it's not nearly as good as people would think when they're in the store and there's like half the stuff is not empty on the shelf or empty on the shelves and there's lines down aisles. Um, the cost of operating a business right now is very expensive. Uh, again, in our business, unlike maybe some other businesses, we've had a tremendous amount of inflation. Um, the first time I've been, I mean, I've been in this business for over 20 years, I've never seen real inflation. This is the first time I've seen real cost increases um, throughout the store and due to competition, we really can't even kind of push that through. So our margins have been compressed, our costs have been up. We are doing better, but not as good as people think. My short answer. Thank you for that. You're a mensch, you're wonderful. I'm glad you're a business person. Senator McCray. Yeah, I think that you, we, we touched on the uh, economic point and I think that um, the client scratched at the, the, the income piece of it, um, you know, just so that folks can understand, like when we think about the city as one in four folks in poverty, so 25% poverty, when you think about the, uh, the you were shaking your head, Madam Chair. Uh, that's because I, my question to you was about the healthcare implications. Yep, yep. So, okay. so, so the income piece of it, but then you also, like you said, you have the health. A lot of our young people, from our school standpoint, 
um, from the people in the neighborhood don't have that option. And, and what is an option for them when they don't have a supermarket, if, for folks that don't know, is typically bodegas and corner stores. So you're doing your traditional shopping um, at a corner store where you're getting a chicken box or, or soda and things of that nature. And it is no healthy options uh, from that standpoint, but that's a reality for a lot of families. Yep, okay. Thank you, Senator McRae. I see no other questions from colleagues. So that will complete uh, this really interesting and educational hearing on Senate Bill 365. Thank you, uh, Senator McRae and witnesses and passing it back to the chairman. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chair. Uh, Senator McRae, you have a second bill, Senate Bill 367 on uh, community development. Uh, we have Senator McRae followed by two opponents, Justin Fiore and Claudia Wilson Randall. Uh, Senator McRae, um, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chan. I did not know that hearing was going to go that long. Let me be very clear. I'm Corey McRae, just for the record, Senator for the 45th District. I come to you on Senate Bill 367, and this one isn't as delightful as Senate Bill 365. This one is a little bit more contentious. I saw all the testimony in opposition for it. Um, I did four years in the House of Delegates. The committee that I sat on was ENT. Uh, one of the bills that came before ENT was removing the local resolution um, and reference the programs that go before DHCD. Now, I always had reservations about this because I thought the transparency was being removed, the opportunity for our constituents that was being removed to actually hear about the development, the council folks, the elected officials um, to bring awareness, but I still voted for it because they said that you have jurisdictions that are just blocking uh, development that could be good um, on race-based uh, uh, opportunities. And I, but I voted for it with extreme reservations. And for the last four or five years, uh, what has happened is that transparency that I thought was gonna go away did just that. So instead of hearing about it from the council meeting where it could fully be flushed out and actually have a conversation about it, the reality is, is I, I get it when it comes to the last stop. The only way that I know about the project is because it has to go before the Board of Public Works and our treasurer then reaches out to our respective districts to say that this is on uh, the agenda and wanted to make sure, just double check from a last second, do you all have any challenge with, challenges with this? And what happens when it goes before the Board of Public Works agenda, I let the treasurer know. No, I did not know that this was happening. My community did not know that this was happening. And could you at least get, uh, I'm gonna reach out to DHCD to advise me on who's doing this project. So at least I can articulate it and actually have a conversation with our community. I'm saying this very respectfully. DHCD is a white led organization. Typically the folks that we are funding, mm. white led organization. The, so the developer is a white led organization. Most of the advocates that were advocating for this, white led organizations. The challenge is, is that we've had historically disenfranchised Chai's communities that don't even have conversations in the development in their own neighborhood. And this is dead wrong. I got a, I got a letter from my uh, constituent and this was the last stop. Ms. Doris Monterell sent me a letter and she's in New Broadway East. And she said, Corey, why do local state and federal government and she named explicitly named the projects have these projects and give this money to these developers without having conversations with the community. And you know what? I said, that's absolutely right. I said that that's not the way it should be. You pay taxes, Ms. Doris Monterell, your money's being reciprocated in your neighborhood and you don't even have a say in the respective projects that happens in your neighborhood. So while the, the folks will come and, and I've not only reached out to the treasurer on one, two, three, four, five occasions to say, introduce me to these developers, that's not the way it should be. So if the advocates disagree that they don't believe that a resolution should go before the council, they also disagree with this bill that they don't believe legislators should know or be able to weigh in on DHCD projects that's coming into their district. There should be some form of notification to where we can ensure that the community is having a process. Let me be clear. There's two sides, two shops in DHCD. And every time that I reach out to the Carol Gilbert side, they're very, very responsive. So they, they might not be proactive, but they're very responsive. 
But there's a side with this neighbor works and the, uh, the four and a half credit, the nine and a half credit, where they're not as, as responsive and they're not in touch with the community and they're not having these conversations. And we as the legislative body have a responsibility to answer people like Doris Monterell in historically disenfranchised communities that don't get a shot at this, that, that don't have the capital and just wanna be in the conversation when you're coming into their neighborhood. This isn't the, the, the advocates, DHCD and the developers neighborhoods. This is their neighborhoods and they just wanna say in their neighborhoods. I apologize, uh, Mr. Chair for uh, going on, but this has been very personal to me because I think that she has a point and she has a right to have a conversation in her neighborhood. Thank you, uh, Senator. Um, we don't, we are not offended by passion. We in fact embrace passion. Um, let's go with Justin Fiore followed by Claudia Wilson Randall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Justin Fiore. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know what? Um, since Senator McCray is the only proponent, uh, let's let's open up the questions. I, I apologize. We usually take one group at a time. Anybody have any questions for um, Senator McCray? I guess I have one, Senator. Yes, sir. And, and look, I agree. You should be made aware. You should ensure there's community input. As I read the bill. It says that you have to endorse it for it to move forward. Um, and look, you know, there's a, a lot to be debated as to whether the state legislator should have veto over development in their district. Um, could you speak to that? I mean, again, let's take off the table. I agree with you. Yeah. Yep. You need to know, number one, the people in the community need to know, but let's talk about that, that higher threshold. Yeah. So, so it, it previously several years ago, there was the opportunity for a local council resolution. Uh, Mr. Chair, you know how the local level already works. So you know that they have to get a respective endorsement for that piece. I heard the advocates loud and clear from that standpoint. And I said, let's give it a shot. So if it's and, and if the advocates are telling me that it's not working on a local level, and I didn't say that it had to be a majority. I didn't say it had to be all, I just said that it had to be one out of them four that sent something to basically say, sign off on this because they know that the conversation. I'm gonna try my best to figure out how to work with the advocates, but I know that there's some form of notification. Maybe it's a 30 day notification that needs to go out before approval happens, but that com that community deserves a, com a conversation uh, uh, from that standpoint. And I know that that's not happening. And I know that nobody's representing them. And I know it's my duty to have, for them to have representation. So, so I do agree that at least one, at least one, maybe not all four, maybe not a majority, but one of them in there should at least sign off on it before it happens. Thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, seeing no further questions, let's go to the opponents. Back to you, Mr. Fiore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Totally understand. Again, for the record, my name is Justin Fiore. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Municipal League in opposition to this bill as drafted. Um, and I'll say sometimes you hear testimony that opens your eyes. And this is one of those cases. Um, while our members aren't comfortable with the approach of the bill, I just want you to know I hear the sponsor here and it's something that we'd like to address as your partner in governance. Um, people need a voice. Uh, is that it? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's have uh, Claudia Wilson Randall. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Pinsky and members of uh, the Education, Health, and Environmental Committee. Um, I I want to say that respectfully, I I agree with Senator McRae, and I agree that um, community participation is a part of community development, and it's a part of development. So every developer, no matter where you are, whether you're a nonprofit, for-profit, no matter what kind, needs community input. So it is really poor practice that no one in an area would know about a particular planned community. It, it's, it's wrong. It's not the way anybody should be. And it's not to get a sign off. It's simply to get community input to whatever's going on. I don't think, respectfully, I just don't think that this bill 
is going to achieve that. And I think we've got to figure out a way to hold developers accountable and to get community input in particularly in black and brown communities where, outs where it seems or it appears as though outsiders are coming in to uh, do development. So I just, I, I just wanna say that um, I am Claudia Wilson Randall. I'm from the community develop, I'm the executive director of the Community Development Network of Maryland. And I oppose this bill, but I do hear the passion and I do hear the, you know, I, I agree with the, the intent of this bill. Thank you, uh, Ms. Randall. A question for either Mr. Fiore or Ms. Randall. Uh, saying none, uh, that concludes the hearing. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Senator McRae, thank you. Um, yes, sir. The bills, and uh, that completes the hearing. On that bill, we're gonna to move to Senator Peters. He is the only person testifying. This is Senate Bill 509, next to the last bill. Um, National Capital Strategic Economic Development Program eligibility. Uh, welcome, Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is basically a cleanup bill. Uh, two years ago, we passed this bill. Um, and the problem was that we had a bunch of amendments that made it very prohibitive to invest in um, this program. So we followed Department of Housing and Community Development guidelines with the definition of sustainable communities. Um, and we feel like that will open up uh, the ability to contribute to the projects. Uh, we're definitely focused on projects inside the Beltway, Montgomery and Prince George's County. Uh, it parallels the Bernie program, as, as you know, and uh, making sure that that funding goes to projects to help um, create uh, quality communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you Senator. Uh, any questions for Senator Peters? Uh, seeing none, that concludes the hearing. Thank you, Senator Peter. Thank you for your patience. And to the final bill of the day, uh, Senator Smith. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome, Mr. Chairman. This is a 687 State and Local Housing Program affirmative, Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. We have uh, Senator Smith, followed by Matt Hill and Robin Dorsey. And then favorable with amendment, we have Justin Fiore, and there is no one signed up in opposition. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, again, for the record, Senator Smith uh, here represents Senate Bill 687. Uh, we'll try to provide some uh, succinct and efficient testimony here, as I know it's your last bill of the day. Uh, so uh, affirmatively fair housing it basically addresses issues that uh, have been lingering since 1968 when the Federal Fair Housing Act was uh, enacted, which was intended to uh, end housing discrimination and to promote diverse and inclusive communities. Now to do this, it utilized a variety of tools, one of which was uh, the mandate for governments to affirmatively fair housing. Now that directed that HUD programs that they be used to remedy past segregation and discrimination and expand housing choices and make all neighborhoods places of opportunity. Now, uh, when it was enacted, the Fair Housing Act actually lacked some specific enforcement through regulation. HUD never designated or implemented robust system to support the jurisdictions in meeting their obligations under the act. So over the past 50 years, many jurisdictions and programs that received the federal funding from HUD have actually failed to uh, fulfill these obligations under uh, the act in 1968. So as a result, housing discrimination has obviously persisted even here in Maryland. Now, during the Obama administration, um, the <clears throat> Housing and Urban Development Agency, they actually adopted a new regulation to more strictly enforce the mandate. Uh, it actually required jurisdictions that received those federal funds to uh, assess what patterns of housing discrimination that they had uh, come up with, and, and they had to come up with a plan to actually diminish or address them. It also provided a database tool for communities to use during this assessment process. Now, when the following administration came in, uh, Secretary, then Secretary Ben Carson rescinded that rule in 2020. Now, absent a, a new administration, and that's not a political statement, it's just an acknowledgement of a new administration, a potential uh, change in course of direction. Um, 
because there is no uh, effective measure of enforcement at the federal level, uh, that responsibility has been now been regulated to, our, to us here at the state level. And we have to continue to take that action to further fair housing. So uh, in order to deconcentrate poverty and take some of these proactive steps, discrimination, segregation, and increase opportunities, uh, we can require the Department of Housing and Community Development to promote housing equity, fairness, and opportunity uh, for all mar for historically mar marginalized Marylanders. And we can do that by providing a framework for local government and local housing authorities to take those concrete data-driven community member-oriented steps uh, that were mandated in that initial 1968 act. So very simply, uh, members of the committee, what the, what the bill does is it requires DHCD, uh, local housing authorities, and political subdivisions to administer programs that affirmatively fair housing as part of their duty under the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And that's irrespective or regardless of what the federal regulation uh, says. The governor and the General Assembly will monitor these actions to take affirmatively fair housing through and the bill says that you have to have assessments submitted by local housing authorities and political subdivisions to GHCD every five years. And they outline, it's pretty prescriptive in the bill. I won't go out over all the, uh, the data points that are required uh, in the interest of time. And then another report submitted to by DHCD to the governor and the general assembly, aggregating local assessments and outlining the total number of households that receive the financial assistance through state and local programs and the amount of financial assistance provided. Uh, this is disaggregated by race, disability status and income and so on and so forth. You can read the bill. Um, so with that, members of the committee and Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, uh, I would ask the committee for a favorable report on Senate Bill 687. And uh, absent the procedure, I'll wait for questions or take questions now or just wait for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, do you have a couple minutes if we get through the other two uh, proponents and then take questions? Absolutely. Okay, Let's then let's go to uh, Mr. Hill from the Public Justice Center followed um, uh, by Ms. Dorsey from the Consumer Rights Coalition. Please, Thank you, Chief, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Matt Hill. I'm an attorney at the Public Justice Center. Uh, we support SB 687. Thank the sponsor for, for bringing this important legislation. And the need for this bill is clear. Uh, racial segregation and a lack of fair housing opportunity remain persistent forces of destruction in Maryland. SB 687 provides a consistent framework for DHCDs and the state DHCD and local jurisdictions to analyze those forces and provide data-driven concrete steps to address uh, the forces of segregation and a lack of fair housing opportunity. Let me give you an example. So the Baltimore region, according to the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, the dissimilarity index is 64.2. What is that? That's just a measure of how segregated a region is. Anything over 55 is considered to be highly segregated. Now the region was making progress and that dissimilarity index has declined since 1980, but since 2010, it has not declined. It has remained virtually constant. We are failing to make progress in uh, reducing and eliminating uh, segregation and opening up fair housing opportunity in the Baltimore region. Why is this? Well, it's been caused by the segregation, as we know, has been caused by deliberate government actions in the not distant past. We could talk about redlining, exclusionary zoning, transportation policy. Um, you all probably already know this, um, but the point is that now since government played such a role in creating segregation, we need government to play a role in desegregating. Our clients at Public Justice Center uh, feel this impact. They're unable, their tenants, um, in usually very low income tenants in, in various properties who are unable to find quality affordable housing in neighborhoods where they want to send their kids to school. Now the affirmatively furthering rule has been a political football at the federal level for the past 40 years. This bill simply brings some consistency and stability to make sure that regardless of who's in office, um, our state DHCD and our localities are going to be analyzing this data and taking concrete steps to dismantle segregation and provide fair housing opportunity for all people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, uh, Ms. Dorsey. Thank you, Chair Pinsky, members of the committee. My name is Robin Dorsey. I'm the Fair Housing Director at the Fair Housing Action Center of Maryland. 
We work to ensure that every Marylander has access to safe, affordable housing free from discrimination, harassment, and code violations. We're a program of the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition, which advances economic justice and financial inclusion through direct service, research, organizing, education, and advocacy. As you've heard a bit about already, housing segregation did not occur by chance. It was intentionally created over decades. In fact, the first law to encode segregation through legislation was passed in 1910 right here in Maryland. And that law became a model that was then exported not just across the country, but around the world. When the law was struck down, community leaders and housing providers continued to innovate, developing restrictive covenants, exclusionary zoning, redlining, all policies that are designed to keep us segregated by race. Because segregation was pursued with such intentionality, fair housing must be pursued with even greater focus. As we heard, the Federal Fair Housing Act created an obligation for municipalities to actively pursue free and fair housing choice. But more than 50 years later, Maryland is just as hyper, parts of Maryland are just as hyper segregated as they were then. Um, if you look at the Baltimore area redlining map from the 1930s and then look today at where mortgages are made in the city, the maps look almost identical. And the shapes in those maps are so persistent that Dr. Lawrence Brown at Morgan State has named them the black butterfly and the white L. And while Baltimore segregation is particularly stark, this is a legacy of efforts across the state. So what this bill does is create a process at the state level to measure municipalities' progress towards the affirmative obligation created by the Fair Housing Act way back in 1968. The bill doesn't mandate specific strategies that municipalities should use in affirmatively furthering fair housing because it recognizes there are vast differences in housing markets across the state and values community input in addressing the issue. We cannot pretend that the legacy of racism in our housing market is going to disappear on its own. The work of integrating communities, deconcentrating poverty, and promoting free and fair housing choice is long overdue. And so we urge a favorable report. Thank you. I have one more favorable with amendment. Let's take uh, Mr. Fiore and then we'll take questions for both uh, favorable and favorable with amendments. Mr. Fiore. Sure, thank you again, uh, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Justin Fiore, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Municipal League, uh, supporting Senate Bill 687 with amendments. You have our written testimony, but I also want to add that the League is supportive of affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, it's just that many of our smaller members would face significant fiscal challenges in complying with the reporting requirements of the bill. And they are also concerned about market forces surrounding some jurisdictions having far greater impact that a town's resources could overcome. When I read this bill, I think about towns like Port Tobacco with a growing population at last count, but still no more than 30 residents. They would need to hire a consultant to comply with the reporting requirements of this bill every five years, as I understand the amendments, um, just to access small DHCD programs such as the Community Legacy Program, uh, where you might have a, a small $20,000 grant to work on a historic renovation. Uh, and then they still risk not being able to have created enough meaningful change over that period because they don't have the tools or resources to make changes that outweigh market forces. Um, that's just one example. There are others I won't get into for the sake of time, but I'm happy to share with the committee offline. Uh, we've proposed to the house sponsor and are working on finalizing language um, that takes advantage of similar reports that are already being sent to HUD along with including a fair housing assessment um, in every single municipality's comprehensive master plan, which allows municipalities to take stock of the current situation and plan changes at the same time they're making other large planning decisions. This is a process that historically includes state government guidance as well, which would be immensely helpful for our smaller members. We are committed to working with the Senate sponsor and this committee as well to find changes. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Um, questions for uh, Chairman Smith, the advocates, or the advocate with an amendment? Open for questions. Um, there don't appear to be. I don't believe there is any opposition. Um, so thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Smith. Uh, we'll take up the bill, uh, hopefully, next week or two. Um, 
with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to adjourn. The health subcommittee will be meeting in 10 minutes uh, and you will receive a link if there's not already one in your mailbox. Um, I think it's gonna be virtual. So uh, 10 minutes, health subcommittee. Yeah, they should have received it. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, we're adjourned for the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.